And I'm telling you, the devil is not going to have this nation. And you're, the American people are not going to spend their lives being on 90 different medications, sick and afflicted. It's time for revival. It's time for the fire of God to set this generation free. And I sense the presence of the Holy Ghost in this room. Praise you, Lord, tonight. In church, just be blessed. Man, it is great to see all of you out on a Monday night. Be blessed tonight. Be blessed tonight. In Jesus' name. Put your hands in the air and just tell them, using your own words, just tell them, I am ready to receive tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church shouts, amen and amen. Welcome one more time, well, several more times, but one more time tonight, Pastor Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Give Jesus a great big hand clap one more time tonight. How many of you came expecting to receive from the Lord? Before you're seated, I have another question. Uh, does anyone have a testimony from last night where you could tell the Lord touched you? I'm not going to call you up to testify, but you can tell God did something in your body when we prayed last night. See your hands up high. That's great. Great start on night one. And while I'm on the subject, is the lady that saw me on Daystar that got healed, oh, you, have, you must come up. Come with your husband. I know you don't know what you're clapping for, but clap ahead of time. I promise you, you won't take it back. Thanks, brother. One of the worst things about being well-built in the church is you have to carry the pulpit for noodle-armed evangelists. I heard this testimony last night. I met my new friends, and uh, they agreed to, to come back tonight to share the testimony. This... <laughs> We're going to play another one. If you were here last night, you're going to watch it again like I've watched it five times. But how many of you were here and saw that testimony we played of the lady that was 97 pounds getting ready to die? So she said it as, as she was watching that, I'll, I'll, I'll let her tell. But they saw me on Daystar on a Monday night, and I'll let her tell you what was wrong and what the Lord did. Tell everybody your name and where you're from because they think we pay people to, and they're fake people. But uh, tell everybody your name and where you're from and, and what the Lord did for you. It's a great story. Uh, my name is Tanya Smith, and I'm from Sarasota, Florida, and I'm excited to share my testimony with you tonight because I know this was ordained by the Lord. Um, I, uh, I was born with muscular dystrophy, a rare form. There's 43 different forms, um, and mitochondrial disease, which is a genetic defect in every cell of your body. And it progressively gets worse with age, and about 10 years ago, I became dependent on a wheelchair. Um, because using any energy, I would get so physically sick. And then fast forward four years ago, I was so sick that I was totally bed bound. Um, I couldn't stand up. When I did, my blood would pool in my feet, autonomic dysfunction. Um, I was in a wheelchair that would hold me up laterally and also with a headpiece to hold my head up. Um, so on IV fluids every day, also life-sustaining medication for organ function. So I really thought that this was the end. And pain, lots of pain, 24 hours a day with no end in sight. Um, so four years, I'm praying, you know, uh, don't know how to get out of this that I'm in. I mean, I love the Lord. I'm a Bible college graduate. I started to pray because I couldn't read my Bible. I couldn't sit up for more than a couple minutes or stand for more than a couple minutes. And I said, Lord, show me the way to my healing because I can't believe that you would just pick and choose some people to be healed and not others. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? So um, I said, Lord, show me the way and show me in such a way that I can share my testimonies that others might be able to get to that same place of wholeness and healing. And... Um, I turned on Daystar on my husband's day off, and we're watching, and Jonathan came on. And when he came on, it ignited my spirit and my faith in such a way that I knew that I was hearing the message in a different way, in a new way that I hadn't heard before. It wasn't as the world preaches, but as God, 
thank you. But as God's word teaches, right? And Jonathan showed me that, you know, it's not, um, oh, well, if it's God's will. It is God's will for me to be well. I have been healed. So, so I started praying a little differently, and I started telling myself, I have been healed. I am healed. I am whole. And I kept putting God's word in, and I started listening to Jonathan's teaching every day and every night because I could not get enough because I knew that there was truth in the way that he was preaching. And so I said, you know, my body, all of a sudden my body started to line up. I started getting stronger. And I noticed that um, one day I was standing up in the kitchen for more than like three minutes and I was like, this is new. Like, I don't have to go sit down, this is great. And um, so I came across Jonathan on day start in August, the beginning of August. So the beginning of September, I started to get some strength and it was up after my bed, sick bed. So, um, so August, so September, um, si September 19th it was, I went to my muscular dystrophy clinic appointment because I've been a muscular dystrophy patient for years and years and I've gone to the same clinic for 16 years and progressively gotten weaker and weaker and sicker and sicker. And you know, there is no cure by man. Um, so it was really a death sentence. I had made out my will. Um, I was that horribly sick. And um, when I went in, I knew that I had gained some strength, but I didn't expect what was coming because the occupational therapist came in. You see a team of people. She checked my shoulders and my hips, which were always weak, and she said, they're five plus. And I said, I don't know what that means. I never heard five plus. That's perfect muscle strength. <laughs> Thank you. I left out that I was also on a ventilator <laughs> because my diaphragm was so weak that I couldn't take in enough oxygen and I was being poisoned by CO2. So not only IV fluids in a wheelchair, but on a ventilator. Um, so the respiratory team comes in and they do their tests and they said, your respiratory function is above anything that we can imagine. <laughs> We're... <laughs> They said, they said, we are going to recommend that your doctor take you off your ventilator. Is that okay with you? I said, yes, absolutely. So they, um, they send the doctor in. She does all of her tests with my legs and all my other function and says, everything is five plus. We sat there with so much joy on our face. I said, Jesus, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She, she said to me that we only see disease progression. We never see reversal. And we are so excited. And I'm so excited. And I have been up every day since. And I keep counting the months. I'm like, September, October, it's November. I'm still up. And um, the pain has, is almost gone. Um, I have just a tiny bit of pain left, but it's almost gone. They picked up my ventilator. It is see ya, sayonara. <laughs> so... So I just want to encourage anyone that's struggling with sickness to really dive into God's word. And I would visualize Jesus uh, here on earth as Jonathan showed me that he didn't turn any away. He didn't say to the blind man, go away and um, come back, uh, you know, in a week or so after you learned a lesson. Um, that just didn't happen. So um, it is for all, not just me. And um, to God be the glory. And I thank you, Jonathan, for your faithfulness and your ministry. <laughs> What, did, I was tired last night, so if I misremember this, let me know. Uh, misremember is like a Democrat political term that means lied. <laughs> but I'm trying, I, I, I don't, I don't want to lie. But you said last night was your first trip out. Um, well, it was, yeah, like my second trip out without my wheelchair in probably four years. And then I was here all night and standing worshiping, and then I didn't know if I was going to make it today, but... I started praying in the spirit, and Go here ahead. I am. This is her first time being able to get up a stair. <laughs> I'm so happy. You know, let, let me tell you something. If you read in the Bible, 
The enemy never attacked the Israelites when they went to plant their seed, only when they went to get their harvest. And I feel like when I see people uh, in their 50s who worked hard all their life, now supposed to be the time where you get to enjoy your marriage and enjoy, and then the enemy comes and attacks health, where instead of going on cruises and to the beach, you're just going to appointments, and, and that, that's the devil. And I believe God is going, everybody that's in that stage of life, 55 and older, you're going to have the best years that you've ever had. And anything the devil brought to mess that up is getting its neck chopped off tonight. In Jesus' name. I love you. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for sharing your testimony. Go ahead. One last thing. Um, I pressed in, right, to God's word, and I was shuttle-fied. <laughs> I love you. I love you very much. Give Jesus a great big hand clap all over this place. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. The Lord is good. And his mercy endureth forever. Well, you can be comfortably seated. I'm going to play the testimony that we played yesterday, which if you're visiting the revival for the first time, obviously you've only missed one meeting. This is a fantastic Monday night crowd at a great church, one of the nation's great churches that God promoted. When God promotes you, everybody knows you've been promoted. I, uh, I, I flew in at about 9.25 yesterday morning to Pittsburgh to do our 10 a.m. service at Revival Today Church, and when my wife picked me up at the airport, she said there was a lady that drove down from Buffalo, New York to give a testimony, and uh, she said you should have her give her testimony this morning. So... I didn't ask what it was, but uh, I trust my wife because she's never told me that before. And so this testimony we're going to play, which is very similar to, to the one you just heard, this lady, you need to remember, because it was a 19-minute testimony, we cut it down to four and a half minutes, but uh, you guys got that testimony on video, place where we can get it on, in good enough quality to put on TV? All right, good, because you're going to be on Daystar, the, the show you were watching, you're going to be a star on. Because there's a lot of people that are sick, and they, they feel like there's no cure, and, then, and the churches they go to would make you think there's no cure, or the churches they grew up in. I have people say, can God heal diabetes? No, everything but that. He, he can raise the dead, but regulating blood sugar is beyond his grasp. Name me one disease Jesus can't heal. There aren't any. Jesus is a mighty healer. And so this lady, who I'd never met before, um, was down to 97 pounds, and then the medication that they had her on blew out her central nervous system, so any sound was piercing to her. She was just miserable, couldn't sleep, in too much pain to sleep, in pain when she was awake, had to be helped to the bathroom, and, uh, and dying and losing more weight in adult diapers in her 30s and just a total bedridden invalid. And uh, she was watching something on YouTube, and my video popped up, and she clicked on it. The way that God has used that, I'll tell you a wild story, that if you don't believe this story, I don't blame you, because it happened to me, and I, I still uh, have trouble believing it. There was a guy, there was a guy um, out, in, out, in Las uh, sorry, out in Los Angeles, and him and his wife had a big fight, and they had decided they were gonna get divorced, and he went out and uh, was, knowing he was going to lose his family, he was raised Catholic in Mexico before he went to Los Angeles. So he said, I know in times like this, this is where faith is supposed to come in. So he just typed in, what is faith on YouTube, and a video of mine came up. And so uh, he said, I, I clicked on it, and when I listened to you after about 60 seconds, I didn't really care for listening to you. I didn't like your style. Well, that's 40 seconds longer than it takes most people. <laughs> so at least they gave me a full minute. And then uh, he said, I clicked off of it onto something else, and then it popped back on. So I thought my phone you know, must have made a mistake or I shook it or something like that. So I X'd out of it and put something else on. And he said, you came on another time. <laughs> he said, so then I just shut YouTube down and put it in my jeans pocket and went to work and then I heard you with my phone off playing out of my back pocket. This is a true story. So he said, I turned, I didn't shut YouTube off, I turned my phone off 
And then it was a few minutes later, I felt, this back in like 2014, he said, I felt like a burning feeling in my pocket, like my battery was overheating. And I took it out and you were preaching. So he said, after that, I went back, I told my boss I was gonna take a break. And I went out to the truck and said, this must be God wanting me to listen to this. So I listened for your two hour message in my pickup truck, gave my life to, to Christ. And he said, I drove straight home to tell my wife. And his wife thought, you know, if you have a big fight with your spouse, sometimes if you're wired like me, spouse or not, you say everything you have to say, you leave, and then you think of some more things in about 11 minutes and come back for round two. So the wife thought that's what he was doing. But he, so when he comes back in the door, she goes, I don't wanna fight, you know, Louis, we need to separate. They had three kids together. And uh, if I remember right, the sister-in-law lived in the house too. He said, no, I'm not coming back to fight. I want you to see something. And he said, I hooked up my phone to the uh, television and I had my wife sit down and she watched your message for two hours and then she gave her life to the Lord she said about he said about that time our three kids were coming back from school and we played it again and my sister-in-law came in the living room and the whole family got saved that saved the marriage and everything so then I'll tell you the rest of the story that was very odd was they kept messaging me on Instagram when are you gonna to come to Los Angeles to preach? And I kept messaging him, I don't know any pastors in Los Angeles, I'd never preached in California in my life. And so I, I would just keep giving him the same answer, the sister-in-law would message me, the wife would message me. Uh, when are you coming to Los Angeles? I'd say, well, just pray that God opens a door at a church. And this actually started to turn into one thing that got me on a different track in evangelism where I realized you can do things where you don't have to do things in a church. You know, when Peter went to Cornelius' house in Acts 10, there was no church in that area. Peter went to their house. So I was walking into a meeting in um, a hotel ballroom, and uh, they messaged me, when are you coming to Los Angeles? It was like they would do it about every six weeks. And anything in your schedule about Los Angeles, any chance you'll come, we're praying that you come here. And I, I got ready to send them my same blow-off response. And as I got halfway through, I felt the Lord speak to me, are you busier than the apostle Peter? If Peter could make a move as the apostle of the church to go to one city to preach to one family in their house, why can't you? So I deleted what I was getting ready to write and I wrote, I'm gonna come and, and preach just for your family. So then I thought, well, other people might find out I'm in California and wanna come over in here so it's not really fair to their house if 45 other people show up and use all their toilet paper and you know, <laughs> clog their toilets and bust their house all up. So I probably should rent a, uh, a ballroom. And I rented a ballroom at the Marriott in Los Angeles, which was a lot of money for me back then, 2,200 a night, something like that, for one family. And then I had no mailing list or anything. There was no way to, it's not like I could say, well, I'll come reach them and then we can get 1,500 people to come out. I had no guarantee anybody was gonna come out, including them. They could have texted me the night before, hey, they changed my work up, we can't make it. But I felt the Lord speak to me, they're hungry, go get the word to them. That'll show you how much God values somebody that has faith. God would rather send you to one family that has faith than a church full of people that have unbelief. Thank God we're not in a church like that tonight. So I go out there, and then obviously I need praise and worship. So at this point I thought, well this, this, this venture is gonna be a massive financial catastrophe. So we might as well just make it a massive financial catastrophe. So I booked the same praise and worship band I used for Festival of Life. Bass player, drummer, put them up in hotels in Southern California, nothing's cheap. All those guys, they were big musicians, they all ate a lot. <laughs> Paid for all their food and all that. So I'm, I'm in like 20 some grand to go reach one family of seven. And then I went there and we had about uh, 45 the first night. And then I, I did Friday night, Saturday night, and I did a uh, Sunday morning just for them, like our own church in the ballroom. And I think we had 60-some to close out on Sunday that came in. One family flew in from Australia. They said, we heard you're gonna be in LA. We live all the way in Australia, and you're always on the East Coast, but we can make it to California. I was like, listen, it's 22 hours to California. What's the difference if you go 25 <laughs> at that point? You know, but... They came, another family came from Arizona that had been listening online, and I got, to, I got to reach a lot of people. Well, I said all that because 
This is back when I barely knew Rodney Howard Brown. And he found out somehow that I was flying out. He called me up and he said, are you flying to do a meeting in California to go reach one family? By the way, the, everybody in that family got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when the last one spoke in tongues, I, I knew my job was done. So he, he said, are you flying out to California to do a meeting just to reach one family? I thought he was going to say, like, what are you, nuts? And I said, I, I am. And I went to like defend myself. You know, I, I really felt the Lord speak to me. He said, that is so awesome. He said, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me when I heard you were doing that. Because you're willing to go out there for one family, God's going to give you a whole city in California of people. So it was about a year and a half later, the mayor of National City, California, because when, when we preached meetings in Camden, New Jersey, the, um, the mayor was Hispanic, and there was a Hispanic mayor's network. So he told this guy in National City, California, we, or Vineland, New Jersey, excuse me, he said, we had this guy come and hold a crusade in our city. And, and he said, we have former drug addicts that everybody knew in the city coming up to me on the street all the time asking me if we can have him back in the city park because they haven't touched heroin or whatever since that meeting was over. So the guy, the guy from National City sets the whole thing up. And just like Dr. Rodney said, about a year and a half later, we had 2,200 people. It was, it was wild because we had done outdoor meetings before but they were wild meetings. You have, to, you have to have like an authority to calm the crowd down because the way we set the meetings up, it's probably 85 or 90% totally unchurched, unsafe. So everybody's milling around. They're wild. You have to like take authority over the crowd. But when I did that one in National City, it was 90% unsaved, but it was almost all Mexican. And because of the Catholic background, they were seated like it was Catholic school, like good posture. <laughs> because there were risers and they were just I had my dad come out with me, and we had, I think, just over 2,000 people saved. It was, the, it was 2016 because it was during the Las Vegas shooting. The shooting happened Sunday night, and we preached on eternity and how all those people went to concerts and didn't know, and they got saved one after another, precipitated by obeying God to go reach that one family. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you tonight, between that lady watching me on Daystar and what you're going to see now, God has a flow. It's different for everybody. Obviously, it never goes outside of the Bible, but there's no pat way to do things. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons and daughters of God. Did you know God has a flow for your life to get in the flow of the Spirit? That flow will never take you backwards. The Holy Spirit never leads backwards. He always leads forward. The kingdom of God is built on increase. First the blade, then the ear, then the corn on the ear. Our sister told us, uh, give me your first name again. Tanya, I won't forget. Tanya, Sister Tanya told us that she just started listening to the word and believing it and speaking it. And before she knew it, she wasn't trying to be healed. She would just notice herself doing things she wasn't doing. That's because the word is incorruptible seed. And it goes down into the spirit and it starts, it can't be corrupted and it starts increasing whatever receives it. If a man receives it, it'll increase him. If a woman receives it, it'll increase her. If a family receives it, it'll increase that family. If a state receives it, it'll increase that state. That's what's happened to Florida. Florida's pulling the nation up. The economy here is going in the other direction of the rest of the company because Florida is filled with God-fearing Christian people. Even the sinners in Florida are God-fearing. <laughs> Somebody uses the Lord's name in vain at a strip club. Another guy punches him in the face. We don't talk like that here. <laughs> we're, we're Christians at this strip club. They need help, but the point is they're God-fearing. The Word of God never takes anybody backwards. The Word of God takes people forwards. And, I, and we have that on video. That's why we're showing you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're 97 pounds, can't use the toilet. If you let the Word of God come in your spirit, it's going to lift your body up. It's going to lift your mind up. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, when they rejected the Word of God, their minds became dark and confused. When people don't receive the Word, their minds, you watch all these news stories every day. And think, how could a mother do that to her child? How could a mom take her baby in New Mexico and throw it in the dumpster? How could a mom do this? Because when people don't have the Bible, their minds become dark and confused. But 
when a, when a man does receive the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God will start showing you the way forward. That's why I love that testimony. I never met her till last night. I can't take credit for her healing. Well, I met her healed. The word did it. He sent his word, Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and it healed them, delivering from them from all their destructions. Another translation, snatching them from the door of death. She was snatched from the door of death. I liked watching her husband because I, I could feel in my spirit his feeling. To watch your wife deteriorate and pretty much come with the inevitability of what's going to happen and have her prepare her will. And the word of God put everything in the opposite direction. Now you're climbing steps. She's not going to be the last one that stands in this church and testifies that God is a mighty God. Whatever the devil has been doing to make your life go backwards, it reverses course today in the name of Jesus Christ. So... She told me that testimony last night, and this is the one that, let me pray for this lady in the dark hair, in row three, right here, you, dark hair, you're not in trouble, this is not a creative way of kicking you out of the meeting, <laughs> just lift your hands right there, close both eyes, as you do, the power of God comes upon you, God puts a strengthening on the inside of your body right now, and every negative have a great close out to this year. Every negative thing the enemy planned in your life reverses now. In Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mind if I pray for you as well? Nice to meet you. No, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave you hanging. You don't mind if I pray for you? Lift both hands, close both eyes. Power of God's all over you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for healing. That is the children's bread. This is not the age to be sick and weak. That's the world talking that wants to make money off you when you turn 50 and 55 and start sending AARP to your house. Tell you about it. Every, every month, tell you about a new disease that's out that's affecting older people or an economic thing. That how it's being hard on seniors. And you may have saved up money, but now with inflation, many seniors are having to return to work. Just one fear-mongering thing after another. But I'm telling you, when I stood on that platform, I was looking out over the crowd, everybody's going to get blessed tonight. But tonight's 55 and older night. If you're 55 and older, you're going to get doubly blessed. You've been targeted by the enemy. You've sown your seed all your life. You've sown your seed. Boy, I've never seen a group of people that didn't care anybody knew they were 55. <laughs> Normally, if you say that church, everyone says, go ahead. I'm fine. You've sown your seed all your life. And in the time that it's in the time where you're supposed to be enjoying your harvest, the enemy's come in and attacked your wife or attacked your husband or attacked you. God's gonna turn that around tonight in Jesus' mighty name. You can take your AARP and mail it back to him. Tell him I don't need that anymore. I'm not retired. God's unretired me. I'm going forward in Jesus' name. Come on, if you receive that, clap those hands one more time under the most high God. Come on, give Jesus a great big hand clap in Northport, Florida. Um, ben, I don't know if you know this video or not because you just started working with me. There's a video. Uh, you can message the group. It's called 27 Years Barrenness. Barrenness. Erased. And it's a Bishop David Oyedepo video. If you message my nephew Jay, he, he knows where it is and uh, other people will too. If you get that one queued up, I'm going to play it after this one, potentially. I'd at least like the bullet in the chamber. In case I decide to pull the trigger again. Watch what the, the Lord, this is from yesterday morning, and I'm still not over it yet. I posted it on Instagram. I, for whatever reason, from the time I was a little boy going to my dad's revival meetings or my Uncle Ted's, 
I liked miracles. I liked seeing people get healed. I liked seeing deaf people healed. One time I was in one of my Uncle Ted's meetings. He took one of those golden offering plates that had like the burgundy felt bottom. And he said, I'm going to take an offering. He said, everybody that has a hearing aid in one or both ears, come to the altar and pass the plate and put your hearing aids in it. And then he went down the line, 31 people, and prayed for Some of them were war veterans that were deaf in one ear from, from firing rifles. Some of them were war veterans that were deaf in both ears from artillery or being on the runway with the loud jet noise. Some of them were born deaf, and it didn't matter. It went one after another, all 31 ears popped open. I'll tell you about another guy. There was a guy uh, named Joe Martin. He was an evangelist, and then he started a church in Virginia Beach. When his church hit, 11, hit about 1,100 people in two years, there wasn't one person in the church that had a hearing aid because that gift functioned through his ministry. He would do that routinely where he'd say, every, old, every senior that has a hearing aid, come up here, take your hearing aid out, I'm going to pray, and God would pop their ear open. I like that. I like that from the time I was a little boy. I loved watching the power of God move, and now that I get the privilege of being a conduit of that power to other people, it makes me happy to hear how people's lives have been turned around. Watch this lady that was at the brink of death and what Jesus did for her. Go ahead and roll it. But in January, I found myself completely uh, crippled. I was confined to a bed. Um, I had a, my central nervous system was completely destroyed by years of harmful medications. And I had lost feeling in my face. I had lost feeling to control uh, certain, um, any, anything in my body. I convulsed for months at a time. Um, it got to the point where it was too, uh, too strenuous for three people to take me to the bathroom. So I had uh, at 33. That's in May of this year. Diapers. And. I was completely hopeless, and I was unable to sleep, couldn't feed myself, uh, I couldn't read. So one day I was, uh, I was really pressing into the Lord, but I still felt almost like my wheels were spinning, but I wasn't getting anywhere. And so I was on YouTube, um, actually just on someone else's channel, and I saw um, it said miracle service, just a, a picture, and it had Pastor Jonathan on it. And it just jumped out at me, and I was like, well, you know, I guess I'm going to just, pfft, I'm desperate. Here I am, I'm 97 pounds going into, at this time, uh, one of the most shocking things was I was also pregnant. And so going into my second trimester, I was 97 pounds, needing 24-hour care, I would turn on the 24-hour broadcast and just stick it under my pillow at night, and I would have Pastor Jonathan screaming in my ear all night. And my mom would say, you know, in the month of January, I slept only 10 hours, and so I should have um, had so many seizures that I would have died. That's what the doctor said. But I had Pastor Jonathan screaming in my ear, and so it was screaming faith and building faith in me. There was a, a message that Jonathan had preached, and it said, uh, he said, um, behold, be today I sat before you life and death, blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your seed may live. And I, I was carrying, carrying a seed. When we pulled in, there wasn't a parking lot here. And so we pull in and it's all rocky and I'm thinking, how am I gonna roll this stupid thing over here? So I tell my, my person, I said, just park here. She said, that's not a parking spot, I don't care. So we park there, get out, we're rolling up in here, we pull, get into the back, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's a long walk. So, but I felt the presence of God. I walked in and just looking, I felt the Holy Ghost just like a wall. It hit me, and I just began to just tears, and it was like, 
I just felt the Holy Ghost, like putting my faith in action. And I knew that the Lord was meeting me where I was at. And so I came here and Evangelist Kofi after, um, so during that time I still could, I couldn't clap. I couldn't raise my hands. Um, I couldn't stand during worship. So um, I just sat and I did the, the very best that I could. And afterwards, um, Evangelist Kofi laid hands on me and he prayed that God would expedite the healing work that had already become, the begun. So that was the f uh, first week in September. So here I am today and that was the last day that I used a walker. The last day I used a walker. And I drove myself here. God made a way where there seemed to be no way. I drove myself. I carried luggage on the, to the second floor of a hotel. I took the stairs just because I could take the stairs. And I walked here and I parked really far away too. And I walked and look at my shoes before I couldn't even wear shoes because it hurt so bad. There is nobody like Jesus. It's an insult to go to a world religions class and then put them in the same category as anybody else. Well, there's many prophets. Jesus was more than a prophet. He walked in the office of the prophet. He's more than a teacher. He's the son of God made flesh to destroy the hold of the devil on mankind. Can you say amen? amen. Ben, yay or nay on the video? One second or four minutes? <laughs> Once, like, like eight, ETA what, 20 seconds? 60 seconds? Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Good luck staying sick tonight. Genesis 3. This is after. You're good. You weren't lying. You're a good man, Ben. <laughs> Say this out loud. I get, get. what I, I hang around. There's a thing called impartation that most people have very little value for. I don't fly to Pastor Rodney's meetings because he's my friend and I'd like to support the meeting. If he has 3,200 people there and instead of me, be, I choose not to show up so they have 3,199, it probably isn't going to hurt his self-esteem. I'm not there to support him. I'm not there because I'm ordained by his ministry. I'm there to receive of the grace that's on the inside of him. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, I, I perceive that the faith, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 5 through 7, I perceive that the faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice is now in you. So I, am, I, am, I remind you to fan into flames the gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Paul, uh, God told Joshua, Joshua, that thou wilt observe to do. Joshua hung around a guy named Moses that you'll observe to do. There's laying on of hands that brings impartation, and there's close association that brings impartation. The faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice is now in you. Most people only know about passing bad things down to their family. I have a temper because my family has a temper. I have a drinking problem because my grandfather drank, my father drank, and now I drink. But you know you can pass down good things too? The faith that was in, the faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I see now resides in you. What you observe, you do. Brother Shambach worked for a man named A.A. A. Allen. He watched him pray for the sick, and he knew how to minister to the sick. My Uncle Ted worked for then for Brother Shambach. Was in Bible school, heard that R.W. Shambach was preaching in Boston and drove up to see him. And Brother Shambach recognized him. 
because uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania, and my grandfather was the pastor of Brother Shambach's family at First Assembly of God in Harrisburg. He said, are you Mickey's boy? He said, yeah. He said, stand here and help me. And he stood there and helped him from the time he was uh, 18 till Brother Shambach went home to be with the Lord. Well, you observe things when you're around people. If you've never been around somebody who prays for the deaf and somebody brings you somebody that's deaf and need healed, then you don't even know how to pray. Father, help them as they go through this time. But when you've seen A.A. Allen or R.W. Shambach put the fingers in the ears like Jesus did and say deafness and hardness of hearing, I adjure you in Christ's name, come out. And then the ears come open. You have a pattern to follow. When you watch Peter pray for Tabitha in the book of Acts, he basically did step for step what Jesus did to Jairus' daughter when Jesus allowed Peter to come in and watch him raise the dead. If you've never been around people that operate in miracles, you're going to have a hard time operating in miracles. You don't even have a pattern to follow. If you've never been around people that operate in faith instead of unbelief. For example, I'm a minister. Most ministers operate in unbelief. So if you get around them, you learn to say what they say, and then you get what they get. Life's hard. Ministry's hard. People don't give. Church attendance is down. We don't, and you start repeating it, and death and life's in the power of the tongue. But you get around other people that don't talk like that and say, thank you, Father, that in the midst of all the troubles in America, you're raising up a church in Northport, Florida that's going to be packed to the walls. We outgrew the last building. We're going to outgrow this building and God's going to use this church to shake America, then you get a different result. Somebody shout impartation. impartation. And whether you know it or not, along with everything else, that's what you're getting tonight. You get what you're around. You can't sit around somebody that peddles unbelief from the pulpit and it not have an effect on you. And you can't be around somebody that preaches faith into your spirit and it not have a positive effect. I tell you right now, when this service dismisses, there'll be enough firepower released from this building in you to blow the devil's sorry rear end back off the west coast of Florida into the Gulf of Mexico. The man I'm going to play you pastors the largest church on planet Earth. It's a 50,000-seater. They have five services on Sunday, all packed with 200,000 people in overflow, which necessitated them building a 109,000-seat church that they're working on right now that'll be not the largest church on planet Earth. It'll be the largest indoor auditorium on planet Earth, 109,000 seats. The children's church, separate from that, will seat 20,000 kids. 119 escalators. Do you know how much it costs to build one escalator? I mean, I don't either. I was just seeing if, if you do. <laughs> they were announcing how many elevators, how big the parking garage is. It's, it's insane. 12,000 acres of property. A Bible college. A, a, a liberal arts university. And then he's founded, separate from the church, an agricultural school to help so they don't have to start keep asking for food from other places to teach Nigerians how to cultivate the land and grow food like we do in America. One pastor that used to have 11 people average attendance in the 1980s that got a revelation. When I heard that was going on, me and Pastor Rodney flew over there. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see what a 50,000. There's certain things that you see before God could give Abraham, make Abraham what he was, he had to get him to look at the stars. Look at the sand. That's how. Get a picture of how things can be. That's why as much as the Lord's blessed my church, I can't get any pride because, wow, we had a thousand people come. Bishop Oedepo has 5,000 in the choir. So I don't really feel like I'm doing much because I've, I've seen where you can go. Well, how did the church grow that big? The miracles that they announce at that church, the testimonies are otherworldly. A continuation of the book of Acts, and this one really makes me smile on the inside. It'll do something for your faith when you watch it. Go ahead and roll it. Wait, play from the beginning. Look at that scripture with the, with the two 
last one we, we played. This is an interesting scripture. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. Continue. Yet through the scent of water. What's the Bible called? The water of the word, the washing of the water. Though the tree be dead in the ground, there's hope that it'll bud again. The water of the word. That's what happened to that lady. That's what happened to the lady in Buffalo. That's what's happening to you from the inside right now. Go ahead. We are here to testify to God's glory, faithfulness, and exceeding great power in terminating 27 years of waiting and honoring us with our twin boy and girl. We got married in November 1986, and as the years wore on, there was a lot of pressure from within and from concerned relatives and friends. There were several unscriptural suggestions and counsels, but we chose to remain totally dependent on God and His Word, not minding the so-called ticking of the biological clock. When we joined this commission, we faithfully keyed into the prophetic instructions from God's servant and inspiring testimonies from this altar. Among other things, we started giving worship offerings on our baby's behalf. We are committed in stewardship, consumed Papa's books, and remained ever so joyful, so much so that too many people did not even know that we were parents in waiting. We are also especially strengthened by Pastor Faith Oyedeko's quotes, such as, God is too faithful to fail, and there is no close case with God. We had been to every Shiloh since year 2000 with the same prayer request and expectation. And finally, our own Shiloh came. On the last night of Shiloh 2013, God's servant instructed us to make a vow and tie it to our desire. We obeyed with expectation and tied it to our twin babies and gave a truly sacrificial Shiloh offering. We're fully engaged in the 21 days prayer and fasting in January 2014 and immediately after in February, God visited us and on the 16th of that month, my wife was confirmed pregnant. Throughout the pregnancy, every negative medical calculation on account of my wife's age, the fact that this was her first pregnancy and it was a multiple pregnancy, all the neg negative calculations were brushed aside. Uh, so on the 16th of if you can't understand the West African accent, what they're saying is, what, number one, his wife got pregnant with twins. If you get pregnant with twins in your 50s, they don't say congratulations. They start telling you you need to think about terminating the, preg the pregnancy. Yeah. That's what he said. He said on the fact that it was her first pregnancy in her 50s, and it's a multiple pregnancy, we had many unscriptural suggestions about what to do about the pregnancy. So they had to get pregnant by faith. Then they had to stay in faith through the pregnancy. By the way, they don't say it on the testimony, but when they went to go meet with Pastor Oyadepo, and said so they were believing for a baby. He said, what do you want? The wife said, girl. The husband said, boy. And Bishop Boy Depo said, twins, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Go ahead, roll it. November 2014, to his glory and praise, after 27 years of waiting, God gave us... God gave us Orisha Gugami, a girl, and Orisha Jemi, your a boy. Exactly what we asked from him in prayer. Men and brethren, we stand here today with our twin babies purely by the exceeding grace of God, manifested through the release of vibrant and unshakable faith in him. They said it would never happen. They said it could never happen. But they did not reckon with the God of this commission. For truly, these things are impossible with men, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Praise the Lord! I just was calling to remembrance a few of those songs we were conversing with growing up. Erure umbami, Erure umbami, She won't know if he Let me ask this family to come forth here that came out of that 27 year experience. Amen. And I want all our pastors here 
to come and dance on behalf of the church, bringing everybody out of their captivity, turning every chain into testimony. Now listen to this. The Bible says that we should be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Every hanging promise in everyone's life is declared released today. Every hanging promise is declared released today. Come with me, I'm going to dance with you down here. Amen. Now go ahead. And have, now listen. Every delay in anyone's life is terminated today. And every patience you require to flow into your testimony is released upon your life today. Amen. Now, he said, at the end, it shall speak. Though it tarries, wait for it. Now, hear me. Some people have just one more week to their time and they turn their back. None of you will miss your reward. When God says it, he does it. Shame to the devil. All the ones who said it will not happen, shame to them all. And glory to Jesus. Now, I want you to engage in high-level pastoral dance. Amen. What do I call it? If you need to remove your coat, remove your coat. But we are going to dance heaven to acknowledging that we know God did this. Who did it? You know why I was in tears? They stood fast. Unshakably. Unshakably. Never bowed to the bar. Never bowed to the pressures of men. Stood with Jesus. And Jesus has proved it. Grace not to look two ways. You receive it today. Come on now, let's praise him. Lift your hands all over this place. The truth is, some of you should be super happy. Because the devil's already hit you with his best shot. And it wasn't even enough to keep you out of a Monday night revival meeting. There's people here that the last two and a half years have been a living hell. And the devil meant that to drive you away from God. And instead, you've pressed in harder. And tonight is going to be the release of your reward in Jesus' mighty name. With your hands lifted, if you're filled with the Spirit, begin to thank God in the Holy Ghost. If you've not yet been baptized in the Holy Ghost, begin to just tell Jesus that you love him. And thank you for all that he's about to do in your life. Make up your mind that if nobody gets anything tonight, you're getting something from the Lord. Tonight is my night. Make up your mind. Tonight is my night to receive from the Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said. This is a healing service tonight. I want you, if you have your Bible, open to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, who was the devil, the devil came in into a serpent, that's how he got into the garden. Because you've done this, you are cursed. More than all animals, domestic and wild. You, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will put hostility or enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. You have bruised his heel, but he shall crush your head. What does that mean? If you take a Catholic theology book, Baptist theology book, Presbyterian theology book, or full gospel theology book, they'll all tell you the same thing. That was the first messianic prophecy in the Bible. You bruise the heel of Adam, but I will send another. The book of Romans refers to Christ as the second what? Adam. Because Adam had no earthly father, 
And Christ had no earthly father. I actually got blessed going to my wife's OBGYN appointment when she was pregnant with Camila because she said the father, the child will get its blood from the father, not from the mother. That's why Mary carried Jesus. But when she said, I haven't known a man, how am I going to get pregnant? The angel basically said, exactly, you haven't known a man. For the thing conceived within you will be holy. The power of God will overshadow you and you'll become fruitful. If Jesus had an earthly father, he would have carried, think of it, when Adam sinned, sin entered the human race and was passed through the blood from ev to every child. But Christ, the second Adam, born with pure, undefiled blood, came to be the offering for our sin and break the curse of the devil over mankind. If you're thankful for that, go ahead and do what you're already doing. Put those anointed hands together and give God a mighty, mighty shout. You have bruised his heel, but I will send another who will crush your head. Jesus came to crush the head of the devil. He did not, I feel like it's not really said outright, but the way Christianity is taught a lot of places, it's almost like Christ gives you the ability to make it through what the devil's trying to do in this earth, and one day you'll get to heaven. That's not Jesus' Christianity. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 8, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, for this reason was the Son of God made manifest, that he might destroy the work of the devil. For this reason was the Son of God made manifest, that he might destroy the work of the devil. Then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John start to make more sense to you because you see Jesus like a heat-seeking missile when he comes down to the earth and begins his ministry. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, Jesus comes back from the time of prayer and fasting. Luke 4, 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Report. Now, Jesus didn't do one thing until he got filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Then Jesus told the disciples, don't do anything until you receive what the Father promised. For John baptized in water, but in not many days hence, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 4. Acts 1, 8. And you shall receive... Power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Luke chapter 4. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness, but after completing that time of fasting and prayer, he returns in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the Scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I wanna, I'm only with you one week, and I'm not complaining. I'm thankful to be with you a week. But I'm saying if I could leave you with one thing, every time you get tempted to confess, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have this negative thing. Instead, learn to lift your hands and say, thank you, Father. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because you have anointed me. The end time church carries the Spirit of the Lord that was on Jesus and is anointed to do great things for God. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see. Now, most churches in America, you know, even full gospel ones and, and so-called faith churches, they, they spiritualize things that aren't meant to be spiritualized. How I many you know Jesus said he came to give sight to the blind? Many of us have been blinded by society and blinded by... No, he went to people whose eyes could not see. Believest thou that I can make you to see? And Bartimaeus replied, yea, Lord. Think of that. Christ works from the Spirit. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, I, Paul said, I would that you commit yourself spirit, soul, and body. Medicine works on the body. If your shoulder's bad, 
and you go to the doctor. They're going to work on your shoulder. They might even cut on your shoulder and replace ligaments. So human medicine, rub this lotion on your skin, it works on the body. Then metaphysics works on the mind. Picture yourself healed. See yourself healed. Use the power of your mind over disease. But God works by the Spirit. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. What, how did Jesus open Bartimaeus' eyes? Believest thou? With the heart, with the Spirit, man believest. Believest thou that I can make you to see? And he replied, yes, Lord. As your faith is, so be it unto you. He didn't do a laser surgery on the eyes. He didn't tell him to use mind over blindness. He ministered the word into his spirit. That's why I love hearing our two friends, uh, uh, t- Tanya, I had it, should have trusted myself. (laughs) Tanya and Ryan, is that lady's name from Buffalo? What happened? They both accidentally, but it's not an accident. Both found me accidentally. God, God wants there to be people everywhere. He doesn't want to have to direct everybody to me and Pastor Ronnie and Tom. He wants to raise up people that are in every city that are declaring the word of God that though you're sick, though you're bound, though everything's broken, you're only one prayer away from the power of God picking you up out of the pit. He works on, from the spirit out. Master, the tree that you've cursed has withered up from the root. It looked fine when he cursed it. The word goes inside out. If you get born again, how many people got born again last night? 38 on a Sunday night. When you get born again, you essentially look the same after you get born again as before you got born again. At least the next morning. Because it works from the inside out. But over time, it actually does start to have an effect on your appearance. And that's, that's something to understand for healing. I don't understand why anyone, how anyone couldn't understand this. If I made a decision after tonight's service to say I'm a preacher's kid, I was never allowed to party or anything, tonight I'm driving to Miami and I want to do meth. And I start doing meth. It's, you don't have to be a doctor to know you might not be able to tell tomorrow night. But if I do that for a year, that demonic stuff is going to start to take a toll on my appearance. And it's not a positive toll. It's a negative toll. Sin brings a curse upon every part of life. But the blessing also brings a blessing on every part of life. Did you see Pastor David Oyedepo? Did you know that man? He's older now, but in that video, he's 63, 64 years old. Preaching five services every Sunday. Chancellor of those two Bible schools. Clean living. Holy living. The Holy Ghost working. We used to sing a song growing up in, uh, in church. I have Jesus on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. That's how the devil tries to get back you off of Christianity. He says, ah, you've been serving the Lord for two weeks. You don't see any difference. He tries to get you to walk by sight instead of by faith. But my brothers and sisters, if you make up your mind, I'm going to stick with the word. I'm going to do what the Bible says. There is a reward that is evident in every area of life. If you can testify to that in South Florida tonight, clap your hands one more time and give God a mighty shout of praise. Say it so the devil can hear you. The Spirit of the Lord Lord is upon me me. for he has anointed me. What does that mean anointed? In English, you don't use that word outside of church. But my wife's Puerto Rican and uh, I looked it up in the Spanish Bible and I liked it. The word for anointing in Spanish is unción, which even if you're a a, a white boy like me, that sounds like an English word. Unction. They don't use that word much anymore, but you probably heard your grandparents say it. I'm getting an unction to go out and get some chicken. (laughs) I'm, I'm feeling something rise up in me. I had an unction to slap that guy in the head. Something like that. Well, maybe not, but my grandpa, I didn't hear him say that. So unction you get. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. When the anointing comes in, the Bible says if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. The anointing is a quickening force. 
You don't read any verses, and the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he took a nap. You read, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he outran the king's chariot. There's a zeal and a strength in the anointing that affects your natural body. There's a zeal and a strength in the anointing that affects your natural mind. There's a zeal and a strength in the anointing that quickens your spirit. That when you felt like giving up and you felt like everything was over. That's why I was fighting back tears. Listening to Tanya and listening to Ryan. Everything in the natural Everything in their body, everything in their mind, everything from a medical standpoint was give up. But as they listened to the word and the anointing, it was quickening. No, no, you're going to make it. Keep going forward. There's a force in the Holy Ghost that'll take you when you're as good as dead, break you out of whatever prison you're in and lead you to the other side. I'm telling every person in the sound of my voice, if you have stage four cancer, whatever severe thing that they tell you you have, we just listen to three testimonies. Two in America and one in Nigeria. You are not serving a religion tonight. You didn't come to a religious meeting. We are talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who said, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. He's not an idol. He's not a dead God. He's alive and he lives forevermore and he holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Say it one more time. The Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. That the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. To bind up the brokenhearted. The same anointing that opens blind people's eyes will take a heart that's been crushed by the death of a son. Something you went through that in the secular world, they'll tell you, well, that's just something you'll live with your whole life. That's true in the natural. But God has an anointing, the balm of Gilead, that can come into your broken heart and make your broken heart whole again. Every man and woman in the sound of my voice that's gone through harsh tragedy and the devil's used that to steal your joy and it's almost like you've been frozen in time ever since that thing happened that anointing is coming into your heart right now to bind up your broken heart you're not going to be a sad 60 year old a sad 70 year old a sad 80 year old you're going to be the happiest 55 and older this side of the mental institution in Jesus mighty name if you believe it shout I receive it Why so downcast, O my soul? I will rejoice in the Lord and be glad. I'm not giving the devil the satisfaction of seeing me cry one tear. And then when you're a minister, Oral Roberts used that passage, Luke chapter 4. He defined the ministry and said the task of a minister. You know, if you're going to do something, it would help to know what the point of it is. If you're a plumber, you know the point is to help people's plumbing sinks. Toilets or whatever else, water flow. And on down the line, it's like almost everybody knows what their job is supposed to be. But a lot of ministers don't. They think it's to have a nice, clean Sunday service, make sure everything's organized, the lights are on, and they don't know the real purpose. But if you take the ministry from what Jesus did, and Luke 4 in particular, Oral Roberts said the task of a minister is to remove people's pain by the anointing. The task of a minister is to remove people's pain by the anointing. I would say that's an excellent sentence to sum up what Jesus did. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Large crowds follow. Matthew chapter 8 verse 1. I hear people still turning, so I'm going to give you time. I don't want you to do what I did when I was growing up in church. And then the guy just starts reading. You turn your Bible up so no one sees that you're in Nahum. <laughs> Man, was that a word of knowledge? That's a lot of laughter. Matthew 8, 1. 
large crowds. How many of you are happy you came tonight? How many of you can already feel the victory of God in here? There'll be many people healed before we even pray for anybody tonight. You saw the amens tailor off? That's why you have to preach more. Matthew 8, 1. How many feel victory? Yeah. How many are glad you came here? Yeah. Many people will be healed before you pray. I don't know. Matthew 8, 1. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, I know if you want to, you can heal me and make me clean. This is an interesting scripture, which, you know, not that I need to bring it up here because your pastor played his, his cards right. But when people were saying, how would Jesus have ministered if there was an extremely contagious disease going around? Uh, did you ever hear a leprosy champ? <laughs> Jesus ministered when there was a disease going around that society had, had, had deemed so problematic that if you had it, you were to be quarantined away from your family and you weren't allowed to, if you came back within the general public, does anybody know what the, what the punishment was? Stoned until dead. Not a $1,500 fine. And this man comes into the general assembly. What did Jesus do? Spray him down with Lysol? And Peter put on yellow rubber gloves and threw him back in the leper colony? And his nose fell off? No. And then secondly, everybody knew that the penalty was stoned until dead. So think about it. This man wasn't even sure whether Jesus would heal him or not. But he made up his mind, I'm sick of being away from my family. And I'd rather die than live like this one more day. When you get desperate, you're on the right path. Can you say amen? amen. When man says, you know, both of our friends had been given up on by medicine. We're just going to keep you comfortable till you die. When man gives up on you, that only leaves you one place to look. But you know, you can look in that place straight from the beginning. From tonight, all of you will know what it's like to have God as your source from now till when you go to heaven at a ripe old age. If you believe it, can you say amen? amen. Sir, I know if you want to. I don't even know if you want to or not. But I know if you want to, I've heard about you. You can heal me and make me clean of this leprosy. Jesus said, before Jesus healed him, he corrected him. Matthew 8, 1 to 3. I want to. F.F. F. Bosworth said, when Jesus answered that leper, he answered, anyone who has the question, well, is God willing to heal me? Because Acts 10, 34 says, I see very clearly that God is no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he'll do for anyone. What he does for one, he'll do for anyone. Notice, Jesus didn't turn to Matthew and say, hey, don't write this down because then other people are going to read this and think I'll do it for them. No scripture. That's what the Bible means when it says no scripture. Well, you people are easy to preach. No wonder preachers always come down south. I'm used to preaching up in Massachusetts where if somebody raises an eyebrow, you extend the meeting another week. Someone moved. Someone had a facial expression. I saw someone breathe. Jesus didn't say to Matthew, don't write that down. Matthew... Matthew, don't write that down because then people are going to think I'll do that for them. That's what the Bible means when it says no scripture is of private interpretation. What God does for one, he'll do for anybody. When you read this Bible, you're seeing a record of what God will do for you. I know if you want to, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus said, I want to. Be healed. And instantly. How long did it take? How long did it take God to create the whole world? Six days. How long do you think he needs for you? God will never need more than 24 hours for an ordinary human being. Never. There's nobody that came in contact with Jesus that, was he that it took longer than 24 hours for them to be healed. Jesus never put anybody off. Jesus never sent anybody back. Jesus never put sickness on someone who was healthy. I mean, sometimes God will put sick sickness on to test us. No, you're smoking crack. 
like early 90s crack, <laughs> when crack was crack. Not, the, not this watered down stuff. Well, that preacher seems to know a lot about crack. If you can't see Jesus doing it, then you can't build a doctrine on it. Well, there's people, and I want you to hear this, there's people in our family, we call it, break you down to build you up theology. As if God's looking to bust you up and then he'll heal you. I mean, so I've heard, I heard a lady, she's a Pentecostal preacher that has a decent sized platform, talking about how God gave her breast cancer and uh, she learned humility in that time and then was telling Bible college students, you, everybody wants a platform, but are you willing to have the breast cancer? Lady, sickness comes from hell. Sickness is of the devil and it doesn't belong in me for one minute. Can you say amen? Because the Bible says in Hebrews 1, 3 that Jesus, in the New Living Translation, Jesus represents the will of God the Father exactly. So if you think that sometimes God makes people sick, then you need to be able to produce scripture from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of Jesus making people sick to test their faith and teach them a lesson. What did Jesus do to this leper? Sir, I know if, I know if you want to, you can heal me and make me clean. No, the, your faith is being tested right now. And, it, and this is to strengthen you, and I'm leaving you with leprosy. Find me somebody in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus left sick. Jesus healed people on his way to heal people. He was a healing machine. He hated sickness because sickness is the foul offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother's sin. So when Jesus saw it, he attacked it. He hated it. You can see that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 13. There was a woman who was crippled, bent over double in the temple. When Jesus saw her and knew how long she had been that way, Luke chapter 13, he went over and touched her. No permission. He saw her doubled up. He said, uh-uh. Touched her and she stood straight up. Oh, how she praised God, exclamation point. Notice God didn't get glory when it went through her sickness. He got glory when she was healed. Look at the glory that was released to the Lord playing those three videos. God gets glorified when people are bound and Jesus sets them free. I prophesy that tonight God will receive great glory in Northport, Florida. Oh, how she praised God. The leader of the temple was indignant. Who gets mad when they see people healed? Religious people. You know, I posted that lady's testimony that was nine. I know I'm pointing at the mountains. Uh, it's like I have like physical Tourette's. That lady's not there anymore. You know that 97 pound lady that got healed? I posted that on Instagram and somebody wrote, only a backslidden and adulterous generation would seek a sign. You think, you think that was an unsaved person or a church person? Church. Yeah. Sa same spirit that was in that synagogue leader. The leader of the temple saw her stand straight up and was indignant, angry. So I commented to that guy. I said, so you, you would rather her be dead? So you, I'd like to put a ta you at a table with her and tell her you, you feel like she should die. You jerk. Pray you get an Exodus-sized case of hemorrhoids. I don't know if you can pray that scripturally. I'm just telling you. I'm praying it. I don't like that. Who gets mad when people get healed? This guy did. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees did. By the way, that scripture people use, only an adulterous and heathen generation would seek a sign. If that idiot knew original languages, Jesus wasn't performing signs and wonders and then scolding people for desiring signs and wonders. The word in the original language is an astrological sign. When they were saying, show us a sign to prove that you're the Messiah, they meant a sign in, in the stars, ast astrology. And Jesus said only a backslidden and wicked generation would seek a sign in the stars. The sign that he was the son of God. He told them, go and tell your master the things you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the cripple walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the poor are having the gospel preached to them. God wants you healed tonight. If you know that, go ahead and let him hear your hand clap and shout. Hallelujah.
I feel revival in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The le- uh, let me finish Luke 13. The leader of the temple was indignant. There's six days of the week to come for healing, he said. Come back any of those days. And Jesus sternly rebuked him. Thou hypocrite. Did you not untie your donkey to come here? I want you to catch this. Look at the correlation Jesus made. Did you not untie your donkey to bring him here? Then why is it wrong for me to untie this daughter of Abraham whom Satan hath bound? Sickness and disease is like a rope that the enemy puts around people. And Jesus comes and looses that rope. There's a picture of it. There's a picture of it with Samson. The Bible says that Samson was tied with new rope. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, one translation says, the ropes fell off as if they were burned by fire. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, whatever the enemy has wrapped around you, heroin addiction, Percocet addiction, depression, suicide, cancer, any rope the enemy has wrapped around you tonight, it falls to the floor permanently and you go out of here free in Jesus' mighty name. Go ahead, take 15 seconds and celebrate it ahead of time. I hear the sound of the armies of the Lord. I hear the sound of the armies of the Lord. The devil is defeated. Hey, it'll get in your bones. It's like a fire. Shut up in my bones. I'm weary from holding it in. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. He sent his word and it healed them. Snatched them from the door of death. This lady with the flower top on, step out into the aisle. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Lift both your hands all the way up, close both eyes. That's the fire of the Holy Ghost coming into your spirit. It'll make you run. It'll make you leap. It'll make you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I don't believe in people falling down. Well, she fell down whether you believe it or not. Why should this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound? Uh, uh, the leader of the temple was indignant. Jesus said, you hypocrite. Didn't you untie your donkey to come to the synagogue today? Then why was it wrong for me to untie or loose this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound? Who bound her? Satan. Who healed her? Jesus. That'll help keep your theology straight. Because you got preachers in America with Jesus making people sick and Satan healing people. But again, you're smoking crack. 90s Compton crack. (laughs) Who healed her? Who bound her? That's right. They don't switch and do each other's work. Satan doesn't heal people, and Jesus doesn't make people sick. Why, uh, where did I leave off? Why was it wrong for me to untie this daughter of Abraham whom Satan hath bound lo these 18 years? Who bound her? Where does sickness come from? Luke 13, whom Satan hath bound. Job 2, 7, every depressed person's favorite book of the Bible, Job. (laughs) Jonathan is preaching healing. What about Job? I mean, I believe the Bible. What, What about Job? I mean, I I believe God can do anything. What what about Job? What about Job? Job 2, 7. Then Satan went forth from the presence of God and smote Job with boils. Then Satan went forth from the presence of God 
and smote Job with boils. Who smote Job? Satan. Who bound the lady? Satan. Acts 10, 38. No doubt you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good and healing? How many did he heal? All. Who were oppressed by? The devil. Who's the healer? Jesus. Who's the oppressor? The devil. If you think it's your father doing it to you, it takes the fight out of you. But when you realize, there's an old preacher in early Pentecost, John G. Lake, had a bunch of members of his family die, and now his wife, I'm growing up, I think like half the kids died when he was growing up. They had like 13 kids, six died. And then he gets married, and now his wife's dying. And he, he wires down to John Alexander Dowie's church in Chicago if, if he'll pray for his wife, and ends up going down to Chicago. And he said, I was accepting sickness. And then when I heard from the word that it's Satan that does the afflicting, everything in my being, he wrote, everything in my being rose up to cast it off. Because I realized it's not the will of God. It doesn't belong in my body. I'm telling you right now, they make a lot of money off of it. So the commercials want you to think it's normal when you're a man to have a prostate the size of a grapefruit and all that stuff. And, and prostate problems are normal and breast cancer is normal. But we're not Americans. We are believers who live in America. We're part of another family. We don't have heretical, uh, 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 hereditary diseases. We joined a new family and there's no disease that runs in our father's bloodline. Listen to me. Not only are you leaving here healed tonight, you're going to enjoy divine health all the days of your life in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, man, I know you receive it. Go ahead and celebrate it. Celebrate it. Celebrate the blessing. Celebrate your healthy body. The Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Somebody shout a living hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say leprosy. And Jesus isn't done. This, in our family, we call this the healing chapter of the New Testament, really the first 17 verses. Five, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. Everybody say paralysis. paralysis. Leprosy, diseases of the flesh. Leprosy attacked the physical makeup of the body. Hip degeneration, uh, discs in your spine, vertebrae degenerating, organs that are shutting down, hearts that are scarred up and are functioning at 40%. There's a guy I prayed for. Uh, he's a construction guy. He's 70 years old. He's been a farmer his whole life and, and done construction. And he had major heart problems and almost died. And his heart was like at 20%. I prayed for him, his heart went back up to like 80% capacity, and he built our church out from October to December with his son. God will give you, God, the same way God restored that leper, he can, he can do more than just your outward skin. He can do heart tissue, he can do lung tissue, he can do liver tissue, anything that has to deal with the structural makeup of the body. Then, uh, paralysis. My, my servant has a palsy, is sick of the palsy. This one translates it, that he's paralyzed and in terrible pain. What did uh, my, my friend Tanya have? Something that afflicted her central nervous system. Say with me, diseases, diseases. of the central nervous system. So actually, all sickness and disease can be broken into four categories, and Jesus dominates all four categories in 17 verses. Diseases of the flesh, diseases of the central nervous system, what happened? I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord... I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I'm under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go, or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. So Jesus, or this Roman centurion, put the relationship of Christ's word over sickness to the realm of a master and a slave. You can dominate sickness. Can you say amen? amen? You can make sickness do what the word says. You can put it on a leash and tell it, no, we don't have it. You're not over me. My dog doesn't tell me what to do. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. 
Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for who the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home. What you believe has happened. What translate? Leave that up there. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. Anybody have a King James Bible open? Let me, let, me, let me see it there. I would have you read it, but you don't look trustworthy. Uh, <laughs> Matthew 8, 13. Jesus said to the centurion, go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Thank you. As thou hast believed. Say that with me. As thou hast believed. It would have been just as easy, it actually would have been easier for Tanya to hear me on Daystar talking about healing and go, well, if that stuff's real, how come I'm suffering? And have a harsh thing to say. It would have been easy for that Roman centurion to say, oh, they say some guy's over in Israel healing people and he's the son of God. Well, if God's so good, how come my, how come my servant's paralyzed and in pain? So you, can, you react however you want. But if you, instead of going against God, turn your faith towards him and say three simple words that will change your life. Lord, I believe. When Pastor Rodney's told me some stuff that seemed impossible to my head, this next year in your ministry, God's going to do this. I think, I don't know about that. I had enough sense to go, Lord, I believe you. Your word's too big for my little mind to process, but I don't make you subject to my mind. I make my spirit believe what God has said. And it comes to pass. Can you say amen? And all these, all these things that seem so impossible, we got, Tanya, I wish I could put you in a little travel case with your husband. Because I'm telling you, every time I just look over in your direction, how do you doubt? How do you doubt with somebody sitting there that's a miracle? Say this out loud, what I believe is what will shape my life. I don't think that can happen. It won't for you. Amen. Well, I'm talking to you. You're a good guy. But when someone says, I don't believe that can happen, they're right. It won't. I don't believe God can deliver people from drugs. I've been an addict for 21 years. You'll stay an addict. What you believe, as you've believed, it's happened. What you believe, that's not one place. Bartimaeus, what would you like me to do for you? Notice, even being blind, he had to state what he wanted. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Sir, if Bartimaeus was, Bartimaeus was an American, what do you want me to do for you? Whatever you want, oh Lord. No, what do you want me to do for you? God is asking you on this Monday night. I'm not talking to normal people. I'm, talking, I'm not talking to people who wait for Friday night when the place is going to be packed out the doors. I'm talking to Monday night people. Church addicted people. People that had to answer their Christian family this afternoon. Where are you going? Church. Didn't you just go twice yesterday? What are you, becoming a nun? I'm not talking to backslidden people. I'm not talking to lukewarm people. I'm talking to what's right with America. I'm talking to on fire people in Northport, Florida that have made up their mind in a world that's tried to program you for 50 years to turn your back on God. You make up your mind. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Shout it out loud. Lord, I believe. Continuing with our lesson tonight. <laughs> and his young servant was healed that same hour. 14, he's not done. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. Where are fevers located? In the blood. Fevers are in the blood. Diseases of the blood. HIV, AIDS, Hepatitis A, B, and C, sexually transmitted diseases. Diseases you picked up when you were using needles. Sickle cell anemia. I was preaching in, in Cotto Mills, Texas 
And there was a lady, uh, they, they had a ch the church was set up like this, and there was a black lady uh, in the sound booth. I know you're not supposed to say that, but she was black and she was a lady, so I don't even want to say. <laughs> when people call 911, I don't even know how they describe people anymore. <laughs> did you get a look at the suspect? I did. Man or woman? I had never asked. What color was the suspect? I'm not losing my job. He's got 10 fingers, I'll tell you that. This black lady, this black lady's back in, in the sound booth, and I see, well, you have a very interesting laugh, I will tell you that. Pretty good. I'm gonna go stand over here now. There's this lady in the booth, and I see the, I see the power, good, good Lord. I see the power of God hitting her, and she, lift both, she lifts both her hands, and I came back to minister to her, and as soon as I came back, I knew. I said, you were diagnosed with sickle cell anemia in your childhood, and the Lord has taken it out of your bloodstream now. And I got a call back from that. She went out under the power in the booth before I could get over there to pray. And then I got a call from the assistant pastor that she used to have to go into the hospital because I guess it flares up worse as you get older. She was spending multiple days every month, and I guess I've heard it's excruciating pain. And she said she felt the Lord heal her and went back, and they tested that she was sickle cell anemia free, which by the way, that's a genetic blood disease. That's a DNA level healing. That's right. There's nothing the devil's done to you that God can't do something about it tonight. Lift your hands all over this room. Anything you were born with, anything that happened 30 years ago that they told you that's just how you're gonna have to live. My friend, my new friend Tanya, is sitting over there having had her will made out, prepared to die. But he sent his word and it healed them and snatched them from the door of death. You're coming out of here free whether the devil likes it or not. You are not going to be Satan's victim from now till you go to heaven. You're going to victimize Satan tonight by your faith in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, one more time, clap your hands, all ye people. And give God the greatest shout that you've ever given anybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when, when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Everybody say diseases of the blood. So you have diseases of the flesh, leprosy, diseases of the central nervous system, palsy, and diseases of the blood. And those are three of the four categories. Um, when I started doing that show, Check the News, during the, the lockdowns, I started to talk to people that I normally wouldn't have talked to before because I was getting into realms I'd never gotten in. So one of the friends I made during that time was a Harvard-trained physician named Dr. Kelly Victory. That if you want to check the news, I'd have her on the show. And uh, she's a good lady out in Colorado. So when I was getting ready to preach this in West Virginia one night, I was thinking, man, I, for years I've been preaching out of Matthew chapter 8 that there's only four categories of sickness and disease. But then with COVID, doing what it was doing, I thought, what about respiratory diseases? I think I messed up. There's a fifth category that I left out. Then I thought, well, if I missed that one, maybe I've missed other ones. So I called her on the way to church, and I told her what I just told you. She said, no. Actually, respiratory diseases are in the blood, and then from the blood, they attack the lungs. She said, that's why, that's the whole basis of why I'm giving a vaccine in the blood, you know, in, in theory, what was because it's in the blood. And then she said, that's very interesting. She said, tell me that scripture again. And I told her. She said, you know, I never thought about that, but all sickness and disease can be broken into four categories. And uh, amazing. You'd almost think God is all-knowing. <laughs> so underneath those categories, there's a litany of sickness and disease that seems to be growing longer by the day. Also remember this. 
I know I made fun of people that said, what about uh, if there was an extremely contagious disease going around, how would Jesus have ministered? And I made a joke about leprosy. But let's say there was a brand new disease that you have no reference point for in the Bible. And, and, and they wanted to lock churches down again because, well, you know, we don't have anything about that in the Bible. No. When the Bible lists the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28, at the end of the chapter it says, if you do not serve the Lord, every sickness and disease there is, Deuteronomy 28, between verses 58 and 61, every sickness and disease there is, even those not mentioned in this book of the law, will come upon you. So even new diseases are covered by that scripture. They're listed as part of the curse of the law. If you don't serve the Lord, all these curses will come upon you and overwhelm you. Every sickness and disease there is, even those not specifically mentioned in this book. So all sickness and disease, including ones not specifically mentioned in the Bible, are listed as part of the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 28, Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Let me see it up there. Galatians 3, if you can do it in the New Living, it's good. If not, I won't be picky. Galatians 3, 13. So if all sickness and disease is listed as part of the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13. Somebody read that. Hung on a tree. What's that top translation? What's the top translation? Whatever it is needs burned. Curse is everyone that is hung on a tree. The Jehovah's Witnesses say it was hung on a pole. Because... The devil knows the power of the fact that he was hung on, on, on a tree because cursed is everything that's hung on a tree. Do you ever think Jesus came to the earth in the one period of time where the method of execution wasn't beheading or firing squad or stoned to death? They took an old rugged tree and formed a cross and hung Jesus on it because the Bible says cursed is everything that is hung on a tree. So when Jesus hung on that tree, how long was crucifixion supposed to take to kill you? Not everyone at once. Three to four days. How long did it take Jesus to die? Handful of hours. They thought he was faking. Why did he die so quick? Because when he was hung on the cross, all my cancer was already laid on him. I read an article today that if you cut bacon out of your diet, you have a 40% less chance of getting cancer. But what's 40% from zero? So I'm going to have some bacon. Because my cancer was already laid on Christ. My blindness was already laid on Christ. My blood disease and heart disease was already laid on Christ. He took, took, not will take in heaven. I mean, one day in heaven, will I, no. He took all my sickness. How much? All. Let me see all of your Bible. How much of your Bible do you have left? That's right, because I took all of it. So if Jesus took all my sickness, that leaves none left for me. I am telling you tonight, you not only have scriptural grounds to get healed tonight, you have scriptural grounds to be healthy all the days of your life. There are people in this room, one of them's that lady wearing that vest right there. You. There's people in this room, and I don't know, I'm not praying for you, you're fine. And I could barely see with that camouflage hat on. There's people in this room, including this lady, that the last bout with sickness that you ever had will be the last bout with sickness you ever have. Because once you get healed, you don't have to get sick again. The Bible doesn't promise that God will heal you every time you're sick. It says he'll take sickness and disease out of your midst. 
if you serve me, I will take sickness and disease out of your midst. When you're running hard for the Lord, like I've been the last two weeks, you don't have time to get sick and then get healed. You need to live in what the Bible calls divine health. Moses, listen now, Moses, though he was 120 years old, his eyes were not dim, and his strength, his strength was in no way abated. Think about it. What was the last instruction? If you catch this, you're going to have a different 55 and older time. Because if you'll catch this from the Bible, by revelation, you'll just walk in dominion over sickness and disease the rest of your life. I'm telling you, there are people that are going to leave this Monday night meeting. They'll never taste sickness again. You won't be sick. You'll only heal the sick. Can you say amen? You haven't heard me say that too much, but there's a faith level in this room on this Monday night that's not a normal Monday night. We're at on Monday night where normally it takes till about Wednesday or Thursday to get. So I'm telling you, you're going to come out of this place triumphing over the devil like it's breathing in and breathing out. He that began a good work in you, amen, amen, amen. That lady in the vest, I'm telling you, the divine life of God has come on the inside of you. You're not only healed, you'll never battle sickness again. Can you say amen? Amen. When people hear that, they say, yeah, but if you never, he's saying you never have to be sick again. The Bible says you have to die. You don't have to die sick. You can die peacefully in your sleep, not screaming like the passengers in your car. That would be better to do it in your bed. You don't have to be sick. Don't have faith that you have to be sick. You know, if you think, well, I don't know about that, I think, well, then you're going to be sick. Your expectation won't be cut off. What you expect, you experience. The expectation of the righteous will be cut off. People that expect to have it hard in the ministry that are pastors have it hard in the ministry. People that expect there not to be much money because they're in the ministry, they don't have much money because the devil will accommodate your garbage theology. But when you start to line your expectation up with the Bible, that with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. I'll order my angels to that no deadly thing will come near your dwelling. For I order my angels to protect you wherever you go. I'm telling you, you're leaving here healed and you're going to walk in God's divine health. When I told Dr. Kelly Victory that about the Bible, she texted me on and off for about two or three more days after that, finding other stuff from medicine and scripture, and saying, I never, it opened her, her, her eyes up to it, that Christ was not only the healer, he took, in 17 verses, he mastered all four categories. We say, he's four, we've only said three, what's the other one? Verse 16, Matthew 8, 16. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed how many of the sick? This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said he took, not will take, he took. Our sicknesses are removed, our diseases. Put 1 Peter 2, 24 up on the board if you would. I'm going to turn there. 1 Peter 2.24. So there it says, he took by his, by his stripes we are healed. And then what does what uh, 1 Peter 2.24 say? He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his stripes so it's present tense when he's doing it, but then after he did his work on the cross and rose again, it doesn't say you, you are healed or you can be healed. It says you were healed 2,000 years ago. All that happens when you preach is you make people aware of the terms and conditions that they didn't know about. That some preacher skipped over it with them. They were a bad lawyer and didn't tell them everything that belonged to them. Can you say amen? amen? Did you ever hear about the guy that sent his family? This is a true story. Sent his family over from Ireland to the United States. Didn't have enough money to send everybody, plus he had to take care of some of the family affairs. So he sends his wife and kids over and stays back, then finally saves up enough for a ticket and buys it. 
and packs crackers and other bottled uh, waters and stuff for the voyage because he doesn't have any extra money for food. So he puts crackers and milk and stuff in his uh, suitcase. So he's in his little room eating crackers and stuff. And the captain knocks on the door on like day four. Hey, just wanted to check on you. Nobody's seen you at any of the meals. And real embarrassed, he says. Well, I don't have enough money to be at the meal, so I've just packed some stuff in my suitcase I've been eating here. Captain said, let me see your ticket. Looks at it, and he says, your ticket includes dining at the, not in the room for free, dining at the captain's table. They were having lobster and steak and Chateaubriand and all that stuff coming over from Europe. And he's up there eating crackers and milk because he's too dumb to read the ticket. <laughs> and there's a lot of Christians that are scraping by because they've never opened that thing and found out that this thing doesn't only include passage from here to heaven, that on the way, there's a captain's table and the captain says, come and dine. The master calleth, come and dine. It's time to feast on the blessings of heaven tonight in Jesus' name. Ooh. Hey. On that table, there's joy. On that table, there's peace. On that table, there's thanksgiving. On that table, there's righteousness. But there's also a big bowl called healing, health, and strength. And you can have all you want tonight because the ticket has already been paid. Hallelujah. Category number four, sicknesses and diseases that are called, caused by demon spirits. One out of every three people that Jesus ministered to, ministered healing to, there was a demon that had to be dealt with. If you don't believe me, you can go home and do it yourself. If you believe me, you can go home and look at it yourself. It'd be a good study. Take a notepad out, write every healing and miracle that Christ did and you're going to find about one, it almost, it's not exactly, one out of every three, there was a spirit that had to be dealt with. Thou spirit of infirmity. Why should this daughter of Abraham, there was a woman who had been bent double, we read it in Luke 13, by an evil spirit. Somebody just starts getting crippled. You know, I prayed for a lady in Camden, New Jersey, when I was doing the outdoor crusade, she was 26 years old, 26 year old woman on a walker. She'd never been in an accident. Nothing's wrong in the natural. She's on a walker. And then when I got close to her, I was laying hands on 1,100 people that night. So you can't stop and ask, what would you like prayer for? Yeah. Or you're gonna need somebody to pray for you when, when it's done. <laughs> so I was going, be healed, be healed. And then I got close to this woman. She had this harsh look in her eyes that I'd seen before. In New Jersey, you don't have to go to Central Africa or India. Just go to New Jersey. That's why some of you live in Florida now. <laughs> and when I got close to her, I put my hands on her head. And I said, I could just feel a devil. I said, you foul demon. Yeah. I noticed, I prayed for 1,100 people, it's one person. Not, I don't see a demon behind every bush. <laughs> but, but I do, I, I, I did when I got close there. I put my hand on her head, holding a walker. I said, you foul spirit. I commend you to come out of the woman now, in Jesus' name. She didn't go out under the power normal. She st staggered back and like shot off her feet into the grass. When she got up from the grass, she was asking people, where am I? Why am I here? How did I get here? She was under demon power. So then we find out, not only is she on a walker, she was having multiple seizures a day. Out of nowhere. And then she had no seizures. She came back that night with five people, telling them that she doesn't need the walker. Everything just cleared up. Did no back adjustments. It's not like I said, now in Jesus' name, be free. And then also... I'm going to turn your head. <laughs> and the, 
When that spirit left, the seizures went and the, and the crippledness went. There was a lady last Sunday. There was a lady last Sunday at, at our church in Pittsburgh. I gave an altar call for people to get saved. She came forward. She was skin and bones. Kofi told me after the service because I got there late because I was flying in from somewhere. Kofi said when she walked into the sanctuary, she passed out. Went to convulsion. He prayed for her and she sat in the service. She was going to leave and Kofi said, don't leave, stay. So she comes forward to get saved. She's skin and bones and prayed to receive Christ. And when we were praying to receive Christ, she falls out on the ground. And I go to help her up and she goes, <laughs> so I'd preached that day on power over the devil and when she did that I went to the crowd looks like today's going to be an illustrated sermon <laughs> and I said come out of her in Jesus name and it growled again I said no growling no noise no manifestations of any kind I got a plane to catch my plane was leaving in about 20 minutes I, don't, I can't be here all day flinging oil and stuff out And it, le it left right away. I grabbed her by the face and said, look me in the eyes, you're free. She gave me a hug and wouldn't let go. And then I knew why she was skin and bones. I said, now that spirit won't let you eat. I'm gonna pray, God's gonna heal whatever damage came from not being able to eat. Your hunger's gonna come back to you. Pray before you eat, go have a big meal. After I finished preaching, and she gave me a huge hug, wouldn't let me go. So if demons don't show up on MRI machines. So she went for testing and said, now it appears you may have a demon. <laughs> but there's, there's all kinds of people. You're the happiest Christians. I've, you're like how Christians are supposed to be. And God's gonna give you even more reason to laugh and be happy tonight. If that lady went for tests, that's why there's so many people that are going for tests and stuff, and they keep running tests, and the doctors can't tell you, we don't know why you're doing that. And then some, some of the people, they'll think they're making it up. I can't eat. Well, we've run tests. There's no reason you shouldn't be able not to keep your food down or anything. So, you know, just start treating you like you're crazy. But there are people that battle devils. There's people that wake up the same time in the middle of the night every night screaming. There's people that the same time every night get flooded with thoughts of killing themselves and have to battle it off. But the same Jesus that heals blood disease, that heals central nervous system problems, that heals uh, 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 blood disease, no matter what their sickness or what their disease or if they were possessed or oppressed, possessions from the inside, oppressions from the outside, oppressed or possessed by evil spirits, he healed them. Did he do that one day? Or did he do that to fulfill what was written in Isaiah? That there was a Messiah coming. You have bruised the heel of mankind. But I'm going to send another Adam. This one's not going to fall. This one's going to crush your head. And part of that head crushing is the deliverance of every captive from every oppression of sickness and disease and torment. So by the authority of the word of God, I declare you free today. Free at last and free forever. He sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from the door of death. You're leaving out of these doors healthy, whole, sound in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. Turn to Psalm 92. That will be the last thing I read before I pray. Because since it's 55 and older night, I mean it. God's going to especially, he'll minister to everybody, but he's going to especially minister to people of that age group. It's important that you see this in the Bible. This is in the New Living Translation. Psalm 92, verse 10. But you have made me as strong as a wild ox. That's strong. You have made me as strong as a wild ox. You have anointed me with the finest oil. Say this out loud. The anointing, the anointing. brings strength. Let me see that in, in the translation you have up. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. So the Bible says that there is a strength that comes in the anointing, and it's an unusual strength. 
That's why they marveled. Uh, where is Jesus getting all this energy from, Peter wondered. And Peter wasn't some wimp. He was a commercial fisherman, which is still ranked as one of the top two most physically taxing jobs, even with all the technological advancements since Peter's day. Lumberjack and, and commercial fisherman. So Peter did real work, and when he was watching Jesus preach for hours under the Middle Eastern sun, then lay hands, if there's 5,000 men not counting the women and children, and women and children are always more at any full gospel meeting, then you're talking about praying for 15,000 people. That night, they brought him all the sick of the village. And then when he got done doing that, people started bringing their children to get blessed, and Peter went, hey! That's enough. And Jesus said, relax. Suffer not the, the, the little children to come to me. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on the children and blessed them. And they marveled. Where does he get his nourishment? And Jesus said, I get my nourishment or my physical strength from doing the will of the one who sent me. So there's a connection to walking in the anointing and receiving strength for your body. Now, I have an advantage many people here don't have. I'm a secret photographer. I feel like I'm in the Soviet Union holding the meeting. He goes back behind the curtain. The guy doesn't even work for the church. He just came in off the street. He's the manager at Wawa. You know, we're a bad combination because you like to laugh and I like to make people laugh. I feel like the Lord's only going to allow us to be together for one week and then never again. <laughs> Do you know, all kidding aside, when you preach faith, faith has a buddy that runs with it named joy. Yeah. Victory brings joy yeah. and joy brings victory. So when, as sickness is even being cleared out by the word of God, that's why your joy's returning. Yeah. The devil stole your smile. The devil stole your laughter. There were people, I just got back from Montreal, Quebec last week. They just dropped all their restrictions. You couldn't go in there to preach unless you were vaccinated. And I, like I told you, I never got vaccinated because it's difficult to preach when you can't use both sides of your face. <laughs> Hard enough to do it with full range of motion. <laughs> and, and when that opened up, you know, you remember how tense things were in April and May of 2020. They've been like that for two and a half years. My brother had a family, my brother-in-law had a family trying to bring him up on attempted murder charges. I mean, got a lawyer to file the charges because he kept his church open and their 82-year-old grandma died. They're trying to get, get him in jail for a long time and they have that hanging over their head. So when I got there and everyone's laughing, people came left and right and said, this is the first I've laughed in two and a half years. You remember in the midst of COVID, comedians weren't tweeting anymore. The first thing Satan sucks out of your life is joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And there are people, I'm not in Canada, I'm in Florida, but there's people that something bad happened. You know, one way you know joys of the Lord is if you go to a pediatric cancer ward to go pray for someone like I have, no one's laughing in the waiting room. There's not one smile. There's no laughter. It's the heaviest feeling. When I walked in to pray for that girl that had stage two cancer, in Montreal, Quebec, back in 2000, whatever, 14. And I walked by all those parents with their sad faces, waiting to get test results. Has the cancer spread? Has it stayed? Has the treatment worked? They're with their daughter, you know, swollen face from the treatments. Nobody laughing. Heaviness. That's when I made up my mind. I'll never back off this message. Because it is not God doing this to these parents. It's the devil. They're supposed, to, they're supposed to be having like me. Did anybody see the video of Camila running to visit me off the plane yeah. yesterday? I mean, that's, how that, that's what God wants. Yeah. Camila's so skinny, she's like two-dimensional. <laughs> she turns sideways, you can't even see her. <laughs> Waiting to pick me up with a plane laugh and high paw. That's how God, that you might have life and have it the thief comes to steal your health, to kill you, to destroy your body. But I have come that you might have and have it. 
Jesus did not come for you to endure life. Jesus came so you could enjoy life. So I tell you in advance, congratulations ahead of time on the best closeout to a year that you've ever had. And should Jesus tarry, 2023 will be the best year you and your family, you and your wife, you and your husband have ever known. So rejoice and be glad. Stick it in the face of the devil. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. 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 Just like a fish can't survive outside of water, Satan can't function in an atmosphere of joy. You ever, you ever go to churches, all their music sounds like they're having Jesus' funeral every Sunday? <laughs> Nothing happens in there because it's unscriptural. I will enter his gates. I'll come into his courts with. They didn't, they didn't shout for victory after Jericho's walls fell. They shouted ahead of time. And the shout brought the collapse of the walls and they went straight into the city. We're gonna shout tonight. We're gonna let a shout out that makes the devil pee his pants a little bit and clear out to another town. This is the time of the victory of the people of God. God is among his people. Go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. Let it rip. Put on the garment. Hey, there you go. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Come on, 30 more seconds. Let it rip. Praise ye the Lord. Let everything that has breath. God abides in the praises of his people. Do what Fauci told you not to do. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. defeated. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Somebody shout amen like thunder. Somebody shout amen like thunder. Now, begin to move what you couldn't move. Begin to see what you couldn't see. Get your movement back. Get your healing. In this atmosphere, be healed. Be healed. God's presence is here. Victory is here. Be healed in Jesus' name. Stay on your feet, everybody. Verse 12, Psalm 92, 12. But the godly will flourish like palm trees. I'm glad I'm not preaching. I'm glad I'm not preaching in New Hampshire like I was a few weeks ago where I'd have to explain what a palm tree was. You folks know a little bit about that. Those palm trees don't even budge in those Category 5 hurricanes. They're waving bye to the other trees. Bye, Larry. Bye, Mike. But the godly will flourish like palm trees. Every storm that was sent to destroy you, you'll be as unmoved as the palm trees of Florida in Jesus' mighty name. And grow strong. It must say strength. strength. Grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house and they flourish in the courts of our God. That's what church is. When you go to God's house, you receive strength there. You receive, how many of you can tell you're being strengthened tonight? Yeah. Don't lie in church. How many of you not being positive? How many of you could testify in a court of law that you can tell God some, done something to your body tonight? Put your hands up high. Keep them up. 
When that shout and victory came in, that was where the action was at. You got it. Lift your other hand up next to that one. Every hand lifted. Begin to thank God out of your mouth for 30 seconds that you're not leaving here with any trace of sickness or disease. In Jesus' name. I have strength. I'm like a palm tree. The storms come, but they can't move me because I'm planted in the Word of God. India. Every kind of generational sickness and disease, it stops with you. It'll not go one more generation. It dies with you. Generational health. In Jesus' name. Verse 14, Psalm 92, 14. What does that say? It's a little, it's a little mutter. Just sound it out. What does that say? Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. The Bible calls Abraham the father of our faith. Abraham had a son at 99. And then when his wife died, he married another lady named Keturah and had six more kids at 140. Gross. <laughs> Even in old age. Bible says in one translation, even in old age, they'll remain vital and green like a tree. They'll be flourishing in old age. There's a guy up where I live in Pittsburgh. If you've ever heard of 84 Lumber, 84 Lumber is based out of there. I don't know him. He might not appreciate me Tell him, but he's uh, Mr. Hardy that founded 84 Lumber is 99 and a half years old. And he's overseeing three new job sites right now, personally, not sending people, at three new job sites at 99 and a half. I don't, I don't know if he's a Christian. I don't know if he's not a Christian. I'm just saying, whoever, whoever puts this idea in your head that when you're 58, you're like, that floor is further away every year. Yeah, keep talking. You'll be dead by Thursday. Yeah, right. Come on, come on. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Stop thinking sick. Now, it takes a concerted effort because every commercial gets you focused on sickness. Did you use Roundup between the, the years of 2013? I don't know. <laughs> Getting you thinking about cancer. Stay on your feet. Let me tell you one thing. I went to go, I had preached uh, 52 times in 40 days, something like that. This is back in 2013. And I was tired. That was a big deal for me back then. So I was home, I was going to be home for one day. And I like going to baseball games to chill because they're boring. <laughs> Especially the Pittsburgh Pirates. They hit like one home run every other year. <laughs> the Pirates are so bad. I'm not kidding. They light off fireworks when they score a run. <laughs> so I like going because it's, and then hardly anybody goes to the games during the week. There'd be like 2,000, 4,000 people in a 40,000 seat stadium. So I like to go chill. So I went there at six with my brother-in-law. Game was at seven, bought all my food, sat down. Whether it makes you think less of me or not, I'm just telling you the truth. I wasn't looking to witness to anybody. I was tired. I mean, I could have had somebody next to me saying, I don't believe in God. I go, well, hope that works out for you. <laughs> I'm here to eat and watch baseball. Best of luck. So I get all my food, and I'm there before first pitch, and then they go, um, tonight is stand-up to cancer night. So I thought, oh, whatever. And then over the public address system, they said one in every three people will have cancer and then they said um, either they said under your seat is a sign a stand up to cancer sign so hold it up and write down the name of somebody who knows it's been affected by cancer so everybody does it then they tell everybody lift the sign up and I wasn't doing it and it wasn't a faith thing or anything I wasn't doing anything 
You could have said, my mom's name's Judy Shuttlesworth. You could have said, stand up to honor Judy Shuttlesworth. I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> so I wasn't, I don't feel like filling out a card. I was there to watch baseball. So they said, uh, now repeat this after me. I'm not telling you to repeat it. I'm telling the, sta the stadium PA guy. Said, now say this after me. Either me or someone I know will be affected by cancer in my lifetime. And when I heard that, I thought, there's no way people are dumb enough to say that. And I was wrong. Like a mighty chorus from hell. Either me or someone I know will be affected by cancer in my lifetime. And I thought, and this is how I know it was spiritual because I didn't care. In my flesh, you could, have, you could have said, everybody stand up and say, Jonathan Shuttlesworth is a blankety blank blank. And I'm like, hey, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I'm very tired. <laughs> but when they said that thing, I got everybody to repeat that. And knowing what I know, death and life's in the power of the tongue. That just like God can't help you until you believe something and say something, the devil can't hurt you until you believe something and say something. <laughs> when I heard all those people say that, it ticked me off in my spirit. And before I could plan what I was doing. When they all got quiet and sat down, I stood up and I went, not me. Neither me nor anyone I know will be affected by cancer in my lifetime. And I said it strong. And no one clapped like you were doing. But I sat back down and picked up my food and drink. And this guy that had already drank two beers that was sitting next to me, looked at him being his, I don't know, late 50s, early 60s, white hair, white beard. He goes, what'd you say? <laughs> I said, I said, not me. I'm not having that. I said, neither me nor anyone I know will be affected by cancer in my lifetime. He picked up his mug of beer and went, I like that one better. Me too. <laughs> I got one drunk turned around that night. I'm looking to get a few hundred crazy Florida Christians turned around. I don't have to be sick. I'm not being sick. Sickness is not going to be a part of my family. The blood of Jesus has been applied to the doorposts of my home. Healing is my portion, and I receive that now. Come on, if you receive that, one more time. Put those anointed hands together. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. Clap sickness out. Shout sickness out. Healing belongs to me. Healing belongs to me. Healing belongs to me. So I'm supposed to feel bad and get labeled some kind of lunatic faith preacher for getting people to repeat that I, I throw off sickness. I won't want it. But then there's nothing wrong with having a bunch of people repeat that they're going to get cancer. And kiss my gospel grits. We're close enough to Georgia that you know what grits are? Yeah. You're not gonna make me feel bad for preaching faith. Because people have to listen to that sewage from hell. All day, TV, newspaper, everything. Sickness on the rise, disease on the rise. So don't, don't try to make me feel bad for grouping up a bunch of people and for two and a half hours telling them the last bout with sickness you ever had is going to be the last bout you ever had. Jesus paid too high a price for you to struggle. Let me get the band back up here. Everybody stay on your feet. We're going to do something a little different. There's an old Pentecostal saying, don't wait till the battle's over. Shout now. I was going to line everybody up and pray for you like I did last night. I'm sure I will before the week's over again at least once, if not every night. But tonight, we're going to shout for the victory. And I'm not talking, this is not some loud expression of Southern Christianity. They weren't Southern around the Jericho. God gave them a prophetic instruction to shout. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. The devil tries to steal. Why do you think Dr. Fauci never mentioned Buddhist temples? Never mentioned Hindu temples? Never mentioned mosques? We ask Christians not to shout at this time. We ask the preachers to speak at a low volume. 
We ask the singing to be kept at a low level and for no instruments to be played because there's power in the shout of the Christian. Stay on your feet. Psalm 150. This is what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. I mean, I, I owe God a minimum of two minutes of shouting just for the two testimonies from yesterday. Praise him for his mighty works. We don't praise him for what he's done. We praise him for who he is. No, you need to buy a Bible that has all the pages. <laughs> praise him for his mighty works. God likes to be praised for what he's done. Praise him for his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath. On the count of three, I'm gonna have you all pick a key and a note and let it rip and play the drums like you used to in Buffalo before you move down here. <laughs> I feel like I only have to tell you that once. <laughs> hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what these instruments were created for. What, did Satan, what was Satan's job in heaven? Then he got thrown out of heaven. Satan's essentially an unemployed angel now. And then who did God raise up to take his place? He used to sing praise to God. He lost his job and we took his place. That's why Satan hates the church. Because we took his job. So now we're going to do it better than he ever could hope to. We're going to let out a shout. A shout that drives devils out. A shout that drives sickness and disease out. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. On the count of three, don't let anybody do your shouting for you. And I want you to see this. God abides in the praises of his people. Psalm 22, 7. Well, this isn't just some fun exercise. As we shout, the same way depression and sadness creates a magnetization for oppression, the shout of God attracts his presence among the people. The same way it leveled Jericho's walls, it's going to level every trace of sickness and disease. Ah. See it already. Ready? One, dose, three. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. The devil is defeated. Christ is risen. presence with thanksgiving into your courts with praise hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus 
Thank you, Lord, for the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever from generation to generation. Thank you for where you brought this church to. You brought them out. You brought them up and the best is yet to come. We acknowledge you. We give you glory. In Jesus name, everybody said. I'm gonna leave it to the dealer. Dealer's <laughs> choice. Now that you've praised, you can enter into what you feel the worship coming up in you. We're gonna sing one song together. I want every hand lifted. I don't want anybody uh, uh, doing your singing for you. Whatever <laughs> song he leads, I want you to sing it with everything that's in your heart. One time through, let's give God all the worship and adoration for all he's done yes, he and all he's going to do. Defeated, the death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. Cause the enemy's been defeated. The death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. Cause the enemy's been defeated. The death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. Cause the enemy's been defeated. The death couldn't hold you everything that's in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, maybe when you were going through your battle with sickness or oppression, it pushed you away from God. You got discouraged. You allowed it to make you lukewarm, and then before you know it, there was separation between you and God. But you want to come back to the Lord tonight. You want to know the joy of sins forgiven. As you've been in the anointing tonight, you want, I want to live in the presence of God. I want to live in relationship with the Most High God. If you're here and you're young or old, and you've allowed sin to come back in and separate you from God, Song of Solomon says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Some people have one area that they've never turned over fully to the Lord. And the devil uses that to pull it like a string anytime he wants and set you back. But tonight, you can lay all your sins on the altar. You can receive forgiveness of all your sin. Make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. The devil can't stop you. God can't do it for you. You have to make up your mind, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to come into covenant with God. If that's you and you've never done that, or you once did and you fell away, but you want to come to the Lord tonight, I want you to quickly put your hand up high and wave it at me and we're going to pray. I see your hands. I see your hands all over this place. Like last night. This is an amazing thing on a Monday night in America. Very quickly, everyone that lifted a hand, come out of your seat and join me at the altar right now. We're going to pray. Come quickly. Those of you with more boldness, come first. It'll help those that are more timid. Come. Every hand that was lifted, make a public stand. Amen. Amen. Keep coming right to the middle. Come, come all the way up to the altar. Let them right through. God bless you. Keep coming. Every hand that was lifted, come. Amen. Amen. This is awesome. Wow. Wow. So great. Hallelujah. Anyone else before we pray? Amen. Praise the Lord.
People still come. This is great. I live for this. This is my favorite thing. Charles here? Lift both hands all across the front. I want you to pray this from your heart. You're not doing a, like a recital after me. There's, you're talking to God, and he's going to hear this prayer and do a work in you even while you pray it. I'm just giving you the words to say, because some people, if you said, now just pray, they've never prayed. Be like, ask me to fix a car. I don't know how. So I'm going to give you what to say, but make the words your own and say it loud. Say this, Heavenly Father. You sound good. I've come forward tonight to give you my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me in your blood. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my King. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. Now say this, I am saved. I am forgiven. I am clean. Heaven is my home. I'll never turn back. In Jesus' name. Keep your hands lifted. Let me bless you. Father, I thank you for every one of these men and women. I thank you for this amazing hall of souls on this Monday night. As you gave them boldness to come out from the crowd and make a public stand, let that boldness multiply from today. Where when they used to feel timid or would compromise, there would be a strength from heaven on the inside of them, propelling them to do what's right. In Jesus' name, let them know your voice. Let them hear the leading of the Holy Spirit down on the inside and grow in confidence in hearing that voice. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it, Lord. I give you praise. When this thing comes to an end, Father, and we stand before you, let not one of these at this altar be missing. In Jesus' name. I wanna ask a second thing. Every person here that represents a family, let this power now begin to sweep through the whole bloodline. All the cousins, all the uncles, all the aunts. Privet. Lift your other hand to the Lord. Be. And the Russians are strong, man. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. All the uncles, all the aunts, all the brother-in-laws, spouses that don't know the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You can put your hands down and look up at me. Welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. Your sins are all forgiven. God, God doesn't remember. Think of this. Because I had people do this and then after say, well, if you know, if you knew all the, if you knew who I really was, that's not you anymore. God doesn't remember one thing you did before 10.05. Your sins aren't only forgiven, the Bible says they're cast as far as the east is from the west. Never to be, so you don't have to start any prayer with, Lord, you know, all. no, he doesn't. And he wishes you'd quit bringing it up. Say it out loud, I'm forgiven, I'm clean. So now that you've been delivered, now you, got, you walk the right path. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But the trick is to keep heading in the right direction. So this church, when I was younger in the ministry, I'd say, now find a good church. But I quit doing that. Because it'd be stupid just tell somebody, you know, it's like taking an orphan out of an orphanage. Right? Find a good home. Your home. This is a great church. The, I'm... I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this to be complimentary. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe it. This is one of the top churches in the United States of America. 
And so, if you don't have a church, I invite you to make this your home church. If you already have a home church, I would invite you to leave that church and make this your, your home church. Because this is a good church. Amen. I don't normally do this. I'm going to give you my preaching Bible. If you want to do that, I like you. I believe in you. I mean, and it's easy to read too. New Living Translation. Praise God. For whatever reason, you know, some, some people you meet them and right off the bat you don't like them. Then some people you meet and you, you just like them. I like you. I like the decision you made tonight. Like you know exactly what you're doing and you made the right choice and I honor you. So, uh, service here, 10 o'clock, right? Say it again. 10 o'clock every Sunday. And I mean every Sunday. Pastor Tom wouldn't cancel church if there was a nuclear mushroom cloud in the distance. He'd be preaching with a welding mask on. The, the next time this church closes will be for the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Give your new brothers and sisters a great big hand clap on their way back. You can return to your seats. God bless you. Come on, give them a big, big hand clap. You can go back. Now give Jesus a great big hand clap for that big harvest of souls. One more time, shout aloud, hallelujah. Hey, let me tell you, I've been an evangelist for 21 years, and this meeting has some wheels on it. This one's a good meeting. I believe we're gonna see a ton of people saved from families, like it's just gonna, gonna keep going. You believe that with me? I'm gonna give you the opportunity to sow seed tonight. Ben, you can step here, I'm not gonna be long. Uh, we're gonna receive the offering in just a little bit. So if you are a cheapskate, now's a great time to pretend you have to use the bathroom. But I don't think there's cheapskates at this church. Can I use someone's Bible? Somebody took mine. How many of you were blessed tonight? Quick, quickly turn to Luke chapter five. I like that drummer. He's like the kind of church drummer that would spin the drumstick. I knew it. Could feel it in my in my gut. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, one day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds, everybody say great crowds, pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out onto the, into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the rest of the passage because that, that'll give you everything I want to show you for the offering. Number one. Peter took his boat and gave it to Jesus to use to preach the gospel. When Jesus gave Peter's boat back, God never told anybody in the Bible, thank you. You'll never read anywhere in the Bible when God told Abraham, thank you for listening to me. Jesus saying, thank you for using the boat. God never told anybody, thank you. He just blessed people. So God's way of saying thank you is blessing. So when Peter said, you can use my boat, they tell me, you know, you picture if you have to speak to 5,000 people like Jesus was doing and more, 
and you have no microphone, the water and shore acted as a natural uh, amphitheater. So Jesus asked Peter, this commercial fisherman, can I use your boat as a platform? Peter could have said, no, I don't know what you're doing. I'm not really into that. Peter wasn't even that religious after he started following Jesus. And he was a rough guy. But he then said, yeah, sure, use it. When he let him use it, Jesus, did, Jesus never had an attitude in the Bible or God. You know, I'm the son of God, so you should let me use it. He had no entitlement. Thank you for letting me use your boat. Now I'm going to give you an instruction. Launch back out into the deep and let down your nets. And when you do, you're going to catch some fish. Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. They fished at night because, as, as you know, down here in Florida, fish are smart. They can see a little filament line on top of the water. And they weren't using filament back then. They were using rope nets. So if you fished in the day, the fish wouldn't come anywhere near the nets. So they did their fishing at night. And he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll do it. And in the time where you weren't supposed to catch any fish, out of season, they obeyed Christ's command. And the net was full of fish. And the boat began to sink. And a cry for their fishing partners came across the shore, and soon that boat was full of fish, and the uh, nets, were, nets were full of fish, and the boat began to sink. That's called uh, increase by association. When you're with the right people, the blessing that they have comes on you. That, that You can also find that with Laban in Genesis chapter 31, I believe it is. I know that God has blessed me because you're with me. So that carries over, obviously, if it's there. If you partner with the right ministry, the grace that's on them, the grace that was on Jesus came on Peter, then the grace that was on Peter came on his partners. For I've never taken an offering this way before, like I'm gonna do it tonight, but when I played those two videos, and both people were impacted by television and multimedia, we had a door open up to go on Daystar uh, January of this year for one hour. I was on one hour today. I, I love being on Mondays because Monday is usually my tiredest day. It's the day I recover, and there's a digital me preaching to more people than I preached through the whole last week live on Daystar Television. You wanna know how big the reach of Daystar Television is? You know that Seminole Casino up in Tampa? I went in there because they have an Asian noodle bar that's open till five in the morning, and when Pastor Rodney gets done preaching, that's about the only place that's open that you can go eat. It's true. So I went there, and I'm walking by the slot machines. This is a terrible story to tell as a preacher. I'm walking by the slot machines, and this guy with a big mullet in his 50s stands up, and he goes, Preacher! I feel like I keep it down. He goes, Preacher, I watch you every week. Walks up to me and gives me a big hug. He goes, You're really helping me. I feel like thinking, eh, Not enough. But he, did. he said, you're really helping me? You and, that, you and that big guy from Africa. Talking about Pastor Rodney. So there's a guy I would never be able to reach normally that's listening to me every week. Hopefully I'll get him off the one-armed bandit before too long. And in church, but he's hearing the word just like everybody else. So that, that day star, I can't remember, I don't know the exact price, a little over half a million a year. And then we're on Russia, all 11 time zones, 11 time zones. It's five or six from here to Maui, and that's a 13-hour flight. Russia is double that size. We hit the whole Ukraine, all of Russia, and all the Baltic and Slavic-speaking uh, Slavic nations. That's about, uh, that's around a million probably with translation and all that. So obviously not everybody can sow a $5 million seed, or, uh, or, or not a million, sorry, 100,000. So about six or 700,000 for Daystar, 100,000 for Russia. Not everybody can sell 100,000. Not everybody can sell half a million. But some people can, so I'm throwing it out there because when we went on Russia, one guy wrote a check from Washington State. So I heard you're gonna reach the Russian people, sent $220,000, which paid for translation and, and some. And so I'm just, now that you can see tonight the testimonies that media has produced, if you're able, like Peter. Peter took his business equipment and used it so the gospel can get preached. And when he did, 
he had the re a record catch of fish so much that as a commercial fisherman, his reaction was not to say, thanks Jesus, that was incredible. He fell down at Jesus' feet and said, I'm not worthy to be around somebody like you. And I'm telling you, and talk to anybody that partners their business with the advancement of the gospel. When you take what you could rightfully keep, I'm not entitled to any of your money. An offering is a free will offering. But if you buy your free will, say I'm gonna take something from my business and use it so the gospel can go out. Because that's not the last person that has muscular, what is it, muscular dystrophy? Or a central nervous system blown out on the point of death that can't even get to church, that are dying. And television reaches into those places. And so tonight, if God would speak to somebody's heart, groups don't give offerings. There's usually one or two or three or five people in the church. It doesn't even matter if there's a thousand people. It's not the group that produces the offering. And God doesn't bless groups. There's individuals like Peter. God knows how many fishermen were at the shore that morning. But one of them said, here's my boat. And it changed his life from that day forward. There was a guy when I was in Canada, which this shocked me. Because I only knew him when he was doing well. He's very well dressed. He's a young guy. He said he was watching me on Instagram Live and his wife and him had four folding chairs, a fold-out table that somebody let them borrow, and a bed. And his wife was nine months pregnant. And in lockdown Alberta, they were down to their last $40. And when he was listening to me, the Lord spoke to him, give your last $40. And he cried telling it. This guy's telling us, suggesting that people, no, I'm telling you what he did. I'm not trying to get anybody to give their last $40 or their first 40. I'm just telling you what he said. He gave his $40 and he said, then he thought, what am I gonna do? But when God speaks to you about a seed, he has a harvest in mind. Jesus could walk on water. He didn't need Peter's boat. When he spoke to Peter, it's an opportunity for him to go from a lousy fisherman to amazing fishermen. Makes me laugh when you read Mark chapter 10. Peter says to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. If Jesus was me, he'd have said, yeah, I remember when I found you. You were a pretty lousy fisherman, to be honest with you. <laughs> he was no good, he worked and caught nothing. And then, then he goes back out and gets a net breaking, boat sinking harvest of fish from taking action to advance the gospel. So he said when he sent that 40, they raised his pay from 50,000 a year to 80,000 that week and targeted it one year back. So he got one year back pay plus a $30,000 a year raise and said that's how we've now flown here to Quebec to come see you, everything's taken off. If you saw them now, you'd have never known. They, were, they had four folding chairs and a folding table. God changed their life. That's from last year till now. So. I'm asking you, I say that because I was never told that part growing up. Pastor Tom didn't know that part. So you give because you know it's in the Bible, but nobody ever got you to focus your faith that the offering's not to help God, the offering's to help you. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that's so great you won't have room enough to receive it. Try it and let me prove it to you. So anyway, just ask the Lord what would be your best. And then I want you to target your faith that I'm sowing this, that 2023, should Jesus tarry, will be the year God uses me and my business to suck the wealth out of the hands of the wicked and bring it into the, to the hands of the just. And Jesus, man, this is a good church. People don't normally clap during offerings. They boo. Hallelujah. Say, well, let, all right, if you're on board, then let's just say it in advance. Close both eyes. Say, thank you, Father, in advance for a net breaking, boat sinking, harvest coming my way in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I tell you something? You'll never be broke another day in your life. You'll never struggle financially again in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. When's that lunch? somewhere again. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, that's Tuesday. Then we're half done, then it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And this one week of revival that sounds so long at the beginning will zip by. 
Do everything you can. Share that testimony. I put it up on Instagram. I'm J.D. Shuttlesworth. I have 31,000 followers. I'm only saying that because if another guy that looks like me starts asking you, dear brother, how people even get confused? Jonathan, is this you? Can you picture me calling you dear brother? Like it's the 1700s. But I'm just saying that if you find another account that's got like 300 followers and they're asking you for money to help something out, that's not me. 31,000 followers. And then that has my, uh, that video testimony of that lady. If you want to share that, it's powerful. If you want to share it on your, your feed and then help get the word out for these great meetings at Foundation Church with the toughest pastor with a heart of gold. Pastor Tom Lapper. And his swagger filled wife. Before they receive the offering, let me pray for one more person that I missed. This lady in the white shirt, blonde hair. Yep, stand up and step into the aisle. The power of God was on you real strong about 35 minutes ago and still is. Lift your hands all the way up. Everything you believed God for tonight, it's already done. Be filled in Jesus' name. There it is. Go right through you. More, more, and more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Many miracles. Your family is going to be full of miracles. At Christmas time, you're going to have many reasons to sing praise to God around your Christmas tree. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you're making out a check, make it out to Revival Today, and you spell thousand, T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. If you're watching online, revivaltoday.com, and you click Give Now, and I'll say thank you to all the people that give online. We're banned on YouTube until Wednesday. The day after the election. I wonder if that was coincidental. By the way, I'm not a prophet, but the uh, Democrats will lose control of the House and Senate. Because 2022 is a year of breakthrough and turnaround. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. And then I would like to say to any Republicans watching online that are, I'm talking like the actual Republicans going into office, try to freaking do something this time. On that note, please welcome Pastor Tom to receive the offering and to give you a proper benediction. See you tomorrow night in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. All right, is everybody, we got, we got people in position? All right, let's receive the offering. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Let's see if we can set an all-time record of speed in receiving the offering. I'm just kidding. Praise you, Lord. Pass the buckets. Pass them down the aisle. There, if you got one coming, don't pass it down that aisle. We're the worst church in America in taking offerings because we don't do it. I asked Pastor Jonathan if he wanted me to ruin the offering like I did last night. He said, no, I can ruin it myself. Nobody could mess up an offering like I did last night. That was, that was impressive. That was a galactic feat of incompetence. <laughs> well, what's really strange about it is that no matter how much I mess up in front of uh, about 500 people, my heart rate doesn't even go up anymore. Police work deadened me from the inside out. I mean, I have nothing. It just stays right. I flatline. And you're probably like, you're nervous right now. I'm not. Uh, it, it's, it's not happening. I'm good. You're like, I'm vaping right now, trying to fill time because we are really slow at doing this. Our people really don't even know how to pass a bucket. They're like, what is this thing? This isn't a large steel trap right at the door that we all. But I do want to say this. This is a heck of a giving church. I mean, we don't ever pass a plate, which Pastor Rodney is not thrilled about, but you know, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not changing anything. 
this is a massive giving church on a per, on a percentage basis. If you're if you're not a tither and you're choosing Biden, Biden's economy, that's up to you. But on the whole, as far as percentages are concerned, more people tithe in this church. Then I mean, I, I can't say because I don't know what every other church does. I can tell you we're way above the national average. Way above it, way above it. And I can flat out tell you that if I won't go into, I'm not gonna make this long, it's 1026, you'll be out the brown doors by 1030. And that's with the full walk and the prayer clothes, everything. But I will flat out tell you one last time that if you connect, I didn't, I told Pastor Jonathan this last night when I was giving, trying to make up my excuses for blowing up the offering. I've blown up a funeral too, you should have seen that. <laughs> Horrible. But anyway, I still, my heart rate never went up. I went, okay, just blew up that funeral. <laughs> Can't fix it now, so I might as well just go home and take a nap. But anyway. <laughs> Can't fix it now. But this church, I was telling them, I said, you know, we just, I don't really know how to do anything. I just Bible thumb. That's all I know how to do. And I've gotten, but what I did was, is I connected, okay. Stay with, stay with me. I was talking to another preacher today. You wanna know why he's successful in the ministry? I was listening to this other guy on YouTube. I'm a preacher and I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And him, he talks normal. Whether you like Pastor Tom or someone doesn't like Pastor Tom, no one could ever leave and go, I didn't understand what he meant. No one ever leaves one of his sermons and says, what do you think he meant by, if you vote for Joe Biden, you'll split hell wide open. So he, he, he knows how to communicate. He's actually an expert communicator and, and, and likable, and you're, you're an excellent pastor. And that's why, and this is a sign that the Lord's well pleased with you. Thank you guys, love you. S stay standing up while you're there. And I wanna tell you this, this is what I was gonna tell you. Stay standing up, we're leaving right now. If you sow to the right ministry, that's what changed my entire life in ministry. I told Pastor Adana Coward Brown, I don't even know if I'd be in ministry anymore, honestly. But what I did was I connected, and the first connection that I made was financial. And you're like, well, I blew it tonight, I didn't give. Well, don't worry, we got them Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Make sure that you connect financially and watch and see what happens to your wallet. In Jesus' name, every hand in the air. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. We're coming back Tuesday, coming back Wednesday, coming back Thursday, coming back Friday to split the gates of hell wide open. We're going to invade hell and we're taking back territory in Jesus' mighty name. And the church of Jesus Christ shouts amen and amen. Love you all.